right, welcome back. And this is one of a few series in exponential and logarithms. This is part one. So we'll start at page one in the guided notes. So we have a, another topic to introduce, exponential. So what is an exponential function? Well, it's where the exponent is an unknown. Generally, we would just call that x. General form of an exponential function is a times b to the x. So for now, we're just going to let a equal 1, and we'll see what happens. We do have the possibility for negative bases. Now, these will have bases represented by b. So we're going to have two main, opt two main specific cases here. One will be the exponential growth, where the base is one greater than 1, and one where the base is between 0 and 1. So here, the base is going to be 2. Now, if you go ahead and use the calculator and type in the values, you'll get whatever you get. All right, so in using the calculator, what happened is you know, when you graph it and you actually go to the table, you get that. But if you go to the graph, you're going to see that it definitely increases. So if I plot some of these points here, you know, 1, 2, 2, 4, and 3, 8, uh, you know, at zero, one, and, you know, and what's going to happen is if you go on the left side of this, what will happen is it's going to be another horizontal asymptote. So this will have a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. Now, if you also take notice, you know, we already established that the base is two. And as we're increasing by 1 in each case, we are actually multiplying by 2 here. And we keep on doing that forever and ever. So if we go in the opposite direction, this graph is just going to get closer and closer to 0, but it's never going to quite get there. Now, the nice thing is, you know, pay, let's pay close attention. Some of the special points, 0, 1, and 1, 2. Now, this 2 is our base. Now, for exponentials, the domain is going to be all reals. Now, but the range, now, it's going to start at 0, but thing is, it is not included. So, it's actually greater than 0, but as an interval, it will go from 0 to infinity. And that's what the range is going to be. So we have the horizontal asymptote and so on. Now, if we go down to this next one where the base is 1 half, now that is going to be an exponential decaying model because the base is between 0 and 1. So if I do 1 half raised to the x and graph that, I have what appears to be an exponential decay function. Now, it is actually the it is actually a reflection of the first one, but we're not too concerned about that. What I'm really concerned about is you know the asymptotes, the domain and range, and so forth. Now, a exponential function just like this, you know, it's still going to have a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. So that's going to be the case with any of these. Now, domain is still all reals. In fact, for any exponential, it's going to be all reals. The range is going to be from 0 to infinity. So that range has to do with whatever the horizontal asymptote was. Now, with the special points, you know, 0, 1, just like before, because if you remember, anything to the zero power is one, and this one goes through one and one half, which this is the base. And if you actually go, you know, increasing x by one, we're dividing the corresponding y value by two, or simply multiplying by a half. So that's all we're having to do here. And that's not a coincidence because 
this is a exponential decay function. Now, when the base is greater than one, we could call B, the base B our growth factor. Now there is going to be a slight difference between growth factor and growth rate. Growth rate is R, it's B equal to one plus R, and that can easily be converted to a decimal or and a percentage. Now when the base is between zero and one, this base B is now the decay factor, and the decay rate, you still have B equal to one plus R. However, R is going to be negative, which indicates a decaying model. And we can convert that to a percentage. So for this one, uh, now this value in front, that's going to be the initial value. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So what happens is the base is 1.23. Obviously, that's a growth. So if we set B equal to 1 plus R, 1.23 equaling 1 plus R, R is simply going to be equal to 0.23 or 23%. So that is the rate of growth, or growth rate, 23%. Oh, that's pretty impressive. Now for this one, this is a decay model because the base is between 0 and 1. So if we set this base equal to 1 plus R, you know, 0 0.98 equaling 1 plus R, R is negative 0 0.02 or negative 2%. So that is the rate of decay. So, now what happens is I might give you an exponential function to model this. Uh, 3125, now here's the thing, f of x equals 3125, and this 3125 that's in front, that is what we would call our initial value. Now, you'll see initial value problems if you go on to differential equations, but, you know, for, inter for initial value, you know, this is going to be pretty straightforward in my opinion. Now, X is the number of years since 1950. So, the reason we do it like that is because we don't want to have huge exponents. So, in 1950, you know, how many years is that? That is zero since 1950. So what would happen is x would equal zero. If we did f of zero, that would be 3,125 times 1.07 to the zeroth power. Basically, you're just left with 3,125. Now, if we want to figure out the population in 2000, uh, X will be 50, because that's 50 years since 2000. So, we figure out F of 50, and we'll round this to the nearest person, 3,125 times 1.07 to the 50th power. And that's going to be... 92,053 people. So what happened was, you know, this model obviously overestimated. Now, obviously, since this was a growth, the growth or decay factor is 7, you know, 7% growth rate. Now, I don't know of any municipality that could grow that much. So let's say we have this, we model a bank account after X years. We're going to find the money to the nearest cent after 100 years. So this $500 is your initial investment. And in the real world, I don't know of any bank account that would pay 5% on something like this, but you know, some say they will. If we set that to 100, 1.05 to the 100th, we have $65,750.63. So 
So when you think about it, yeah, that is obviously a growth. This is a 5% rate of growth. And the growth factor would be 1.05 or 105%. So now, truth be told, probably the best bank account I've seen, the highest interest rate is probably 2.2%. Now, we can graph exponentials by transforming. Now, unlike in previous courses, I am not actually doing this by discovery. Instead, we're just going to, uh, we're just going to see what happens. You know, I'm just going to kind of tell you what happens. And, you know, you can read through this, you know, but the two main points to remember for the parent function are 0, 1, and 1B. And that will enable you to do any kind of transfor transforming. End behavior approaches the horizontal asymptote only on one side. Now, the parent horizontal asymptote is y equals 0. Now, if we have that multiplier, we could either vertically stretch or vertically shrink it, depending on if A is positive or negative. And we could reflect it if that A was negative. Now, we could actually reflect a function over the y-axis by replacing the x with a negative x. Uh, if we shift, you know, vertically, you know, plus K, that's shifted up or, you know, shifting vertically, basically what happens there is we also shift the horizontal asymptote. And, you know, if we have an x plus or minus h, we'll have a horizontal shift. That really doesn't change anything much. So, uh, also we could actually do horizontal stretches and shrinks. If you remember, you would divide the x coordinates by c in that case. So that's what you'd have to do for that. So uh, what's going to happen is we have 2 to the x minus 3. So I'm going to graph the parent function first. It'll go through 0, 1, and 1, 2. And it will, well, not the best looking graph there, but that's because I'm using this pen pad. And we have the horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. So what happens here is this x minus 3 means we shift it to the right by 3. And then this plus 5 means we shift up by 5. Now, so what we can do here, you know, our two main points, 0, 1, and 1, 2. If we shift that to the right by 3, and then up by 5, 0, 1 becomes 1, 2, 3, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it'll become uh, 3, 6. So we'll plot that on this. Now the 1, 2, we shift it to the right by 3, we go 1, 2, 3, and then up by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we are now at 4, 7. Uh, and here's the main thing. This horizontal asymptote, since, you know, since the original function had that, we are going to shift that up as well. And it will now be y equals 5. We'll have a horizontal asymptote of y equal to 5. So then we can graph the rest of this just like this. Now, if you want, you can actually use the calculator to graph this. So it would be, let's just delete this, 2 to the x minus 3 plus 5. And when you graph that, it's going to look just like that. Now, the domain is still going to be all reals. We're not changing that at all. Now, the range, instead of 0 to infinity, it's going to go from 5 to infinity. Now, the range will still be parentheses here for this. So that's how that's going to work. And we 
do get a y-intercept if we actually hit trace zero, we have a y-intercept of 5.125. Uh, you know, we don't have any x-intercepts. This will not cross the x-axis. And anyway, as of right now, we really don't have the proper information to figure out the x-intercepts because we haven't gotten to logarithms yet. So that's how that'll work. Now for this one, the parent is 3 to the x, so if I start here, you know, 0, 1, and 1, 3, and graph it, and then do my asymptote. So here's what happens. You know, 0, 1, and then 1, 3. I always like to mark these points. This is a negative x. So what happens here is we could basically divide the x values by negative 1 or multiply them by negative 1. We get the same thing. So then what effectively we do reflect this over the y-axis. So what happens here, this 1, 3 becomes negative 1, 3. So yeah, we reflect over the y-axis, but 0, 1 still stays the same. So what ends up happening is basically this. And we do have another part. We shift down by 2. Now, it will be more streamlined when you see this on your test. So the horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals negative 2. Now what was once 1 negative 3 is now, I mean negative 1 3 is now negative 1 1. What was once 0 1 is now 0 negative 1. So it should look something like this. So this actually does have an x-intercept and a y-intercept. So if I go to graph this, that is 3 to the negative x, Minus 2. Yeah, so this actually has, so yeah, the y-intercept is 0, negative 1. Hey, we already realized that. And if I wanted to figure out the x-intercept, I could, but we're not going to worry about that. Now, the range domain is still all reals. However, the range is now from negative 2 to infinity. So that's going to be the range. Now we have one where we have a multiplier in front. So if I start off with the parent function of 2 to the x, you know, 0, 1, and 1, 2, yet again, why 2 to the x? It's because the base is 2. Probably not the best looking graph here. But here's what happens. You know, we have that 0, 1, and then 1, 2. So here's what will happen. This negative 4, we have a vertical stretch by 4. But in addition to that vertical stretch by 4, we are going to be reflecting over the x-axis. So what was once 0, 1 is now 0, negative 4. And what was once 1, 2 is now 1, negative 8. So not the best looking drawing, but you'll deal with it. And we haven't done our... So basically you have to do any vertical stretch or shrink first. Now that's actually going to be very easy because all we have to do here is this is taking it 2 to the left, left by 2, and then up by 3. So what happens is our original horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals 3. Now we could actually just do this, you know, do these other two points point-wise, 0, negative 4, well, 
you know, that would be negative two. Yeah, move, move it here. So let's see, that would be negative two, negative one right here. And then one, negative eight, that's left by two and then up by three, one, two, three. So that would be at negative one, negative five. And this is what the graph is gonna look like, boom. Now, the domain is still all reals. However, the range of this bad boy, instead of going from, it's actually gonna be from negative infinity to three. The reason the range is so different is because of the reflection over the x-axis. So that's how that happened. Now, oh, I, that was a typo for this. Let me write up something real quick and we'll fix that. So we'll change this from four to the two, four to the two X minus five. So, you know, zero, one and one, four and all that good stuff right here. So what happens here is thanks to this 2x, we divide the x's by 2, and that's preserving the y's. That was also a horizontal shrink by 2. In no way would I actually give you a horizontal shrink, horizontal and a vertical stretch together. Although that wouldn't be too bad. Zero, so that's still going to be 0, 1, but now we're going to have 1 half four. Now this minus five basically means we shift it down by five. So we have our horizontal asymptote here of negative five and we can just shift the points. You know, what was one half four is now one half negative one. What was once zero one is now uh, zero negative four. and we graph it. So domain is all reals. The range is now from negative five to infinity. So now when we get into the log, uh, graphing of logarithmic functions, we'll see that the domain changes appropriately. So we'll keep on moving with this. We can actually use exponential growth and decay functions to solve equations and find values. Generally, an exponential model will be of the form a of t equal to a times 1 plus r to the t, where a of t represents the amount after t time periods and so on. So, so this national debt model is represented, this is, by the way, in billions. This is in billions of dollars. Now, of course, we know our national debt is measured in trillions. Now, T is the number of years since 1945, so that's going to be our base here. So if T is the number of years since 45, that means T is going to be zero. So 101 times 1.044 to the zero, it's going to be our national debt of $101 billion. Now, in 1920... Well, that is 25 years before, so t will be negative 25. Now, you, one of the things I stress in statistics is, you know, the modeling doesn't always work, you know, especially when predicting backwards or forwards. But we're still going to do that here, 1.044 to the negative 25, so... If we do this, 101 times 1.044 to the negative 25, what we get out of that is 34.4 trillion dollars, I mean billion dollars. Now, if we want to predict the debt in 1990, well, this model so in that case, T would be 45, that was 45 years. So if we did 101 times 1.044 to 
to the 45th power, what that's going to be, and here's the really nice thing, I can just, you know, if you're using your calculator, you know, type in like 45, and type over that, and that is going to be $701 billion. So we haven't hit trillions yet according to this model. Now the debt in 2019, well, we need to figure out how many years has been has that been since 1945? That has been 74 years. So 74 years. So 101 times 1.044 to the 74th, and we use the calculator to figure that out. And let's see what we get. You know, 74th. That is going to be 2.444, basically 2,444 billion or 2.444 trillion. Obviously, this model is not right because our national debt is in the tens of trillions. It's, I think, like something like $20 trillion. Now, in 2050, we're going to predict this. That'll be 105 years from now. So I'm just going to skip that and do and replace this with 105. And that'll be $9,287 billion. Or $9.287 trillion. Now the growth rate... Now, 1 plus R equals 1.044, so that gives us a growth rate of R equal to 0.044, or 4.4%. 4 yeah, I think our actual growth rate of the national debt is higher, but we'll deal. Now, Later on, we're actually going to be able to solve problems for certain y values when we get into logarithms, but right now we're just going to do some prediction. Now, let's say you purchase a valuable coin at $500, and it is supposed to increase in value by 1.31% each year. So, if R is 0 0.0131, that means the base is 1 plus 0.0131, so the base is 1.0131. Now the initial value is $500 times 1.0131 to the T. And T is the number of years that have lapsed. So we can actually predict the value of this coin 10 years from now and 50 years from now. So 10 years from now, 1.0131 to the 10th, we'll round that to the nearest penny, and 50 years from now, so, and if we use the calculator, so, after 10 years, it's going to be $569.50. Not really a big growth. Now, after 50 years, let's see what that's going to be, what that coin will be worth after 50 years. That coin will be worth, that coin will almost have doubled in value, $958.49. Now, the nice thing is, uh, yeah, I mean, this is probably a very conservative estimate. You know, check investment, you know, what do things appreciate at? Obviously, this is what we call appreciation. Now, we can have depreciation, such as, let's say we buy a new car for $18,000. Now, what happens is R is negative 0.073, so the base, which is 1 plus r, you know, 1 minus 0 0.073, that's going to be 0 0.927. So 
So the model would be $18,000 times 0.927 to the T. So we're going to predict the value of the car when it is one year old. So we just replace the T with 1, 18,000 times 0.927 to the first. Then we'll do 18,000 times 0.927 to the fifth. And then 18,000 times 0.927 to the 20th. Now, yeah, are people driving cars that are 20 years old today? Probably not. So 18,000 times 0.927 raised to the first, that would be $16,686. Not bad. Now, if we did this after five years, let's see, after five years, what would this car be worth? $12,321.72. Now, after 20 years, well, at that point, you know, it becomes a classic. I'm driving a 12 and a half year old car, but it would be worth uh, $3,952.46. Yeah, $3,952.46. So if you're ever wondering how you are taxed on cars in the state of North Carolina, generally they come up with a depreciation model like. Let's say like when you get your car taxes and it says we value your car, that's an appraisal. That's not what you would get. That's just something they came up with. You can dispute it. I wouldn't dispute it on mine because my taxes are nice and low. So moving on, we can use this function A, which is, again, our initial value, where N is the number of times interest is compounded in a year. So R is going to be 0.05 and T is going to be 10. Either way, we're going to put $5,000. Now, let's see what happens if it's compounded yearly. I mean, yeah, yearly, that's one compounding. What if it were compounded monthly? And then what if it were compounded daily? Well, let's see what happens. 5000 times 1 plus 0 0.05 over 1 to the 1 times 10. We'll figure what that is momentarily. For this one, we'll have $5,000 times 1 plus 0 0.05, this time over 12, but it's going to be raised to the 12 times 10 power. Now, since your calculator can handle that, you should be able to see, you know, 12 times 10 is 120. And then 5,000 times 1 plus 0 0.05 over 365 times to the power of 10 times 365. So let's see what happens. 5,000 times 1 plus, and I'm actually going to set up a fraction here, 0 0.05 over 1 to the n times t. Well, that's just 10 times 1. And after 10 years, we would have $8,144.47. Now, if for some reason interest were to be able to round up, they wouldn't. The bank would just truncate it and cut it off. So we're going to change this now. We're going to change that n value to 12. So instead of you know 10 times 1, it'll be 10 times 12. But I also need to replace this. And I have 8,235 and 4 cents. Yeah, it should be five cents, but the bank would only, the bank will take that out of you know they'll just take it. Now let's change it to three hundred and sixty-five. Let's see what happens now. Three hundred and sixty-five, and what happens here? We have eight thousand two hundred and forty-three dollars and thirty-two cents. So what's happening basically, 
you'd think it is getting higher and higher, but because you know this is exponential, it is going to reach a limit. There's only so much that this could be. And that's a good lead into the next part where if we actually did some calculations here, we replaced n with 1 and so on, we're going to learn how this exponential base called E, Euler's E, looks like Euler, but it's pronounced Euler. So what we're going to do here is, you know, replace n with 1, so 1 plus 1 over 1 to the first. I'm not going to write this out each and every time. So what will happen is, you know, 1 plus, I'll set up the fraction, 1 over 1 to the first, and what we get out of that is 2. Now, if I replace the n with 2, let's see what happens now. So we'll put that to the second power, and we'll have a 2 here. We will get 9 over 4, and that'll be 2.25. So it is going to get a little higher. Now let's see what happens if I replace this with 5. And I'm going to actually put a 5.0. So 1 plus 1 over 5 to the 5.0. We get 2.488. So let's keep, let's see what happens here. Let's now replace the n with a 10. Or 10.0. We get 2.5937. We'll just take it to four decimal places, 2.5937. Now we'll call it 100 and then 1,000 and then 10,000. 100. And we'll do, you know, 1,000. So we'll replace that with 1,000. And notice that it's not getting much bigger. 10,000.0. Then 10,000 here. So for 100, you know, 2.7048. Then for the 1,000, 2.7169, and then for 10,000, 2.7181. So it seems to be getting closer and closer to something. As n gets closer and closer to infinity, the value of f of n approaches 2.718 and so on. This is Euler's number e. So why do we even bring this up? There's a lot of uses in mathematics. You'll see it in 172. You would see this in Calculus 2 when you're doing series. A lot of series converge to E or some multiple of it. Now, based on that, you know, $5,000 uh, for 10 years at 5% interest, obviously at daily it was 8,243 and 32 cents, I believe, for daily. Yep. So what we're going to do is we want to see, you know, $5,000 for 10 years, so 5,000 times E to the 0.05 times 10. Now, where to get this E from? 5,000, and it's not the alpha E, you have to hit second LN, 0 0.05 times 10, and we get 8,243 and 60. So, what this means here is basically, this is the continuous compounding. If I did it by second, you know, it's just going to keep getting, uh, it's just, it's never going to be higher than this. This is like the max value in that case. All right, so for the exponential function, we can also model with base e 
This models the population of Oakland, where T is a number of years since 1900. So in 1950, we're going to let T be 50. This is the actual population. E to the 0 0.041 times 50. And let's see what we get. 543 times E to the 0 0.041 times 50. And we get 4,218 people. So, all right. So uh, that's going to do it for this uh, video here. Starting in the next video, that's where we'll do the logarithmic functions. We've done all the exponential stuff here today. So the next video will be logs. So enjoy. All right, so this is Unit 5, Exponential and Logarithms, Part 2. So starting here on page 9, we're going to learn how to graph logarithmic functions. So the first thing we need to do is just graph 3 to the x. And if you remember, uh, it will pass through 0, 1, and 1, 3, because the base is 3. And you can just connect them and it'll look just like this. Now, it will have a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. So, just some of the basic answers of this, you know, domain of the function is going to be all reals. The range is going to go from 0 to infinity. Y-intercept will be at 0, 1. And we have a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. Now, what we're going to be doing with this is determining the inverse of this algebraically. And that's going to introduce logarithms. So the purpose of a logarithm, it, one of the purposes is to solve an exponential equation such as 3 to the x equals 50. Now, we know that 3 to the 3rd is 27, 3 to the 4th is 81, so we know x is going to be between 3 and 4. Now, Ordinarily, you would keep trying values between 3 and 4, and you just have to be very quick with the calculator, but we can get a more exact answer. How do we get this funky combination of logarithms? Well, we're going to figure that out. Now, to relate an exponent to a logarithm, basically, if you have an exponential equation, b to the x equals y, with base b and exponent x equal to y, we can rewrite it as log base b of y equaling x. So this is something I highly recommend that you memorize. So that's one thing you should get comfortable doing here. So to do this, you know, if 2 to the 4 equals 16, we can rewrite it as log base 2 of 16 equals 4. So for this one, this would be log base 5 of 125 equals 3. Now, if you really wanted to be savvy, you could actually do, oh, not this log, but if you go to math and you can scroll up, you know, to A, log base 5 of 125, and that is going to equal 3. So... And that's relatively new on the Texas Instruments calculator. Now, for this one, you know, it'd be log base 4 of 1 16th equals negative 2. For this one, it's log base 10 of 0 0.001 equal to negative 3. And for this last one, it's log base 10 of 1,000 equal to 3. Now, if we want to go back to this, we have to find the inverse. So going back to f of x equals 3 to the x, all we have to do is simply swap this, you know, swap the x and the y. And basically what happens is we convert this to a logarithm. We get y equals log base 3 of x. Now, in addition to you know, y equals 3 to the x, which happens to go through 1, 3, and 0, 1. 
and it has the horizontal asymptote. So what happens here, you know, y equals 3 to the x. Now we know that 1, 3 and 0, 1 are going to be points. Now if I were to actually graph y equals log base 3 of x, some of the neat things are, you know, when you find an inverse, they're going to have opposite points, 3, 1. So this is going to be 3, 1. And another point will be 1, 0. Now, one of the things you probably should remember is it has a horizontal asymptote of y equal to 0. Now, the, op the opposite of horizontal is vertical. So the log graph is going to have a vertical asymptote of x equals 0, and it's going to look something like this. Now, if you go to the graphing calculator, and we go to y equals, and we go to math and choose option A, log base 3 of x, and hit the graph button, you know, if we hit 1, you know, traced 1, it's going to be 0. If we trace 3, it's going to be 1. Now, 0 is obviously not included. So what has to happen is the domain is going to be from 0 to infinity. That 0 is not included. And the range is going to go from negative infinity to positive infinity, which, if you're keeping score at home, you should realize that the domain and range are flip-flopped. We have a vertical asymptote of x equaling 0, and instead of 1, 3, and 0, 1, it would be b1, where b is the base, and 1, 0. So that's some of the things you need to know about how to graph a logarithmic function. All right, so if we have log base 5 of x, so basically, for the log function, it's going to have a vertical asymptote of x equals 0. And all these log functions, of course, pre-transformed, are going to go through 1, 0, and base 1. Well, the base is 5, so it'll go through 5, 1 and it'll look something like this. So the domain will still be 0 to infinity. The range will be all reals, from negative to positive infinity. So we're only going to be dealing with positive base log functions here. Uh, you know, they'll pass through the point 1, 0, and b1, have the vertical asymptote and all these good descriptions here. And in a vertical stretch, horizontal stretch and shrink, if there's something in front of it, uh, you know, we would divide the x's. I didn't particularly name this, but it still can be done. So that's how this is going to work. Uh, yeah, if there's a c in front of the x, uh, you know, we'll divide the x's by that. So for this first one, you know, we'll practice here log base 3 of x minus 3. Well, what happens is it's going to go through 3, 1, and 1, 0, and it's going to have a vertical asymptote of x equals 0. And so when we do that, it's going to look just like this. And when you take your test on it, It'll, I'll be back to the traditional questions about like how it was transformed and all that. So it's not like I'm going to be expecting you to write all this down in one sitting here. So what happens here is this causes it to move right by 3. And then this causes it to be moved up by 2. So... I can just take my two points, what was once 1, 0, is now going to be 
4, 2. And then what was once 3, 1 will be 6, 3. But the vertical asymptote has to be moved three units to the right as well. So that is actually going to have an effect on not only the vertical asymptote, which is now x equals 3, that is actually going to change our domain. So the domain, instead of going from 0 to infinity, it'll now go from 3 to infinity. The 3 is not included. The range will never change for a log function, negative to positive infinity. And as you can tell up here, it was right by 3 and up by 2. All right, so for this next one here, uh, so for the next one, we're going to have the parent log base 5 of x. So it'll be 5, 1 and 1, 0 with this is your vertical asymptote. And so what happens here, here's our original log base 5 function. Now, this replacing x with negative x, what that does is it causes a reflection over the y-axis. And, of course, since you are a lot of calculator, you can always verify this using your graphing calculator. So to reflect over y, we could multiply or divide the x values by negative 1, and this is what we get. So the asymptote didn't get moved or anything, but our domain is going to be a little bit different. And this minus 3 is going to take the points down by 3. So what was once negative 5, 1 is now going to be negative 5, negative 2. And then negative 1, 0 will be negative 1, negative 3. And it'll look something like this. With a vertical asymptote, of x equals 0. Now for this, the domain is actually going to be from negative infinity to 0. The range is still all reals. And that's all we have to do for that. So for this next one, we'll have log base 4 as our parent function. All right, so for this one, you know, the parent is going to be log base 4 of x. So it'll go through 4, 1, and 1, 0 with the vertical asymptote. So what I always like to do here is, you know, 1, 0, and 4, 1. Now, this 2 here, this is a horizontal shrink by a factor of 2, not... I will never actually give you a horizontal and a vertical stretch or shrink together. So what happens here is we divide the x's by 2. So we now have 0 0.50 and 2, 1. And the vertical asymptote has not changed. But we need to move those two points down by 1. So we'll have 0.5 and negative 1, and then 2, 0. And so, and that was a horizontal shrink by 2, and this was down by 1. So the domain has not changed from the original, just goes from 0 to infinity. The range is still the same. And our vertical asymptote, if you have noticed, you know, the vertical asymptote has an effect on the domain. It's where the domain either starts or ends. And of course you can use the graphing calculator to help you verify some of these points as well. So for this last one, log base 4 of 2x plus 6. So one thing 
that I would do with a function like this. It'll be you know, log base 4 of 2 times x plus 3. So the purpose of doing that, oh, let's not forget the minus 1 that is on the outside. You know, that's just a nice little vertical shift. So if we do that, so obviously our original vertical asymptote is x equals 0. And, you know, it'll go through 4, 1, and 1, 0. We'll do all those horizontal transformations in just a moment. So what happens here is we can divide the x values by 2. So we have 0.5 and 0 and 2, 1, and then shift it three to the right, I mean three to the left. So what happens here is we, we would have two one, we'll have negative one one, and one, two, three, negative two and a half, zero. Oh, let's not forget the minus one. But I can also take comfort in drawing the vertical asymptote, which is gonna be this. So I actually have to redraw these points just down by one, and it's going to look like this. So this was kind of a combined model. This was a left by three and a horizontal shrink by two. So that's how that'll work. And don't forget this negative one, and I'll bring it down by one. So the domain is going to go from negative three to infinity the range is still all reals, and we have a vertical asymptote, x equals negative 3. So, yeah, I wouldn't ask this question on a test if it were an in-class test, but for a take-home, you might find something like this. So, uh, you know, beware. So we're going to keep moving on here. So we've already kind of done this here, you know, rewriting these as logarithms, you know, log base 5 of 125 equals 3. So for this one, you have log base 4 of 1 16th, and that gives you negative 2. Now, you know, yeah, if you have b to the x equals y, and again, as I said, you probably should just really memorize this. You know, log base b of y equals x. A logarithm is an exponent. This actually should explain why, oh, well, we're going to kind of see why uh, things work the way they do when we're adding and subtracting exponents. This is log base 10 of 0 0.001, which is equal to negative 3. Now, you know, I'm going to formalize this a little later, but it is also just the same thing as log of 0 0.001 because base 10 is what we consider the common log. The reason that is our common log is simply because base, you know, our number system is of the base 10. So, for this one, you know, base 3 to the 4th power equals 81. You know, this is base 2 to the 6th power equaling 64. This is, this third one, base 8 to the negative 3 power is 1 over 512. Now, you know, we do know how to convert from log to exponential, so we can apply our knowledge to find these. So like if I wanted to find log base 2 of 64, you have to ask yourself 2 to the what is 64. So basically, you know, finding these logarithms, and you know, that's without a calculator, 3 to the what equals 27, 
Well, we know 3 to the third is 27. So the final answer I'm really looking for is 3. Now, it's true. The nice thing on Texas Instruments is if we go to math and choose alpha A for log base, if we did log base 3 of 27, that will give you a 3 because 3 to the third power is 27. Those of you that don't exactly know, don't remember your exponents, you know, 2 to the what equals 16. Well, that's going to be 4. 9 to the what equals 3. Now, if you remember, the square root of 9 is 3, so x is going to be 1 half. You know, 5 to the what equals 1 over 25. Well, without having to use the calculator, you know, 5 to the x does equal 1 over 5 squared. And if you remember the rule for negative exponents, you know, 5 to the x, it is equal to 5 to the negative second power. So x will equal negative 2. Now, generally, logs are base 10 or base e. Base e is the natural logarithm. We talked about that exponential base e, Euler's number, in the previous, uh, in the first video. So for this one, you know, log base 10 of 5,400, you would actually just need to go log of 5,400 and it's going to, surprise, surprise, give a very ugly decimal. Uh, this is going to be 3.732 and so on. Because if we took 10 to the 3.732 on, we would get 5,400. Now, if you took a log of 3 fifths, you're going to get a negative number out of this, which is negative 0.222. Natural log of 230 is going to be 5.438 because if we actually did e to the 5.438, if we did that real quick, you know, base e, e to the 5.438, no problem, you would get roughly 230. You'd have to go more decimals. So that's what you get. Now this is where it gets interesting. Log of negative 3, what happens here is you get a non-real answer. That goes to show for why the domain of a logarithm has to be only positive, has to go from 0 to infinity. As a matter of fact, if you tried to, you know, log of negative 3 is 0. If you tried to take the log of 0, you get a domain error. So that one is just, you know, not real. And don't worry, I mean, they are imaginary technically, but we're not touching that at this level. So just a few interesting things. Since anything to the zero is one, log base B of one is zero. And it doesn't matter what log base it is. You know, log of one, any log, so log of one, or natural log of 1, you're going to get 0 either way. Even if I did a different base, such as, I don't know, log base 8 of 1, you're still going to get 0. And since b to the 1 equals b, it follows that log base b of b is 1. And some inverse properties of logarithms, basically the if you take log base b of b to the x, that equals x, and a exponent to a logarithmic power, basically that just kind of wipes out, wipes things out. So log base 3 of 3 is just going to be 1. Log base 4 of 1 will be 0. Log base 6 of 6 to the 5th will be 5. And this, 4 to the log base 4 of 15, will just be 15. And, you know, 4 to the log base 4 
of 15, you get 15. Pretty neat. So this natural log is a base E log. Now, if you remember, E is 2.718 and change. So it'll go through 1, 0, and E1. And so basically, all that happens is we shift left by 4 and 3 down. So what happens here is our vertical asymptote originally x equals 0 will now be x equals negative 4. And we can just take, you know, 1, 0. 1, 0 moved appropriately. Yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then down by... 3, 1, 2, 3, and then E1, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 1, 2, 3 down. It's going to look just like this. So the domain goes from negative 4 to positive infinity. The range is all reals. And of course, don't forget the vertical asymptote of x equals negative 4 is what we have. All right, so we can also model using logarithms, and yeah, depending on what the base is. Generally, we'll just use a common base such as natural log or base 10. So for this one, x represents a boy's age. The percentage of adult heights attained by a boy is this. Approximately what percentage of his adult height has a boy attained at age 12? So we have to do f of 12, which is 32 plus 43.6 times log. And if there's no base given, assume it's a base 10. So... If we use the calculator to figure that out, 43.6 times you know, log of 15, we get 83.3%, which interestingly, I remember myself, I remember, don't ask me why, I remember at age 12 was when I broke the five foot mark and I'm six foot now. Five out of six is 83.3 percent. Interesting. Now, the magnitude R on the Richter scale of an earthquake intensity I, I sub zero is basically a zero level, so I sub zero is just going to be one. So if an earthquake is 100,000 times as intense, so basically we just take the log of 100,000 over 1. And what happens here, if we just take that log, and again, it's a base 10, this is going to be a 5. What's interesting about the Richter scale, you know, going from a 5 to a 6 on the Richter scale means it's actually 10 times stronger. So, for instance, and something I might ask here, like let's say I wanted to go from a 5 to an 8. The difference is 3. So, I could just do powers of 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. And that would be a thousand times stronger. Yeah, of course, an 8-point earthquake is pretty damaging. A 5-point is not as bad, but an eight point can cause severe damage within seconds. So for this one, you know, when the outside air is anywhere from 70 to 100, I should say higher, temperature in enclosed vehicle in the sun climbs by 41 degrees in the first hour. So this model's 
the temperature increase in degrees Fahrenheit after X minutes. So after 45 minutes, you know, 13.2 times natural log of 45 minus 10.4. So if you went ahead and punched that in in your calculator, times natural log of 45 minus 10.4, it'll go up by 39.8 degrees. Uh, that's a heavy increase. And that's something you really don't want to mess with. Probably the reason why, you know, interesting thing about these log functions is they have certain domains. And the reason why the domain goes from 70 to 100 is probably the temperature increase is even worse. Now, so what I'm actually going to do here is I think I'm actually, well, I'm actually going to keep this one going. So now we have some formalities. We're going to look at some of the rules for logarithms. So we have the product property, and of course, we're assuming like bases. If the bases aren't the same, you can't do anything. Well, that's not going to be the case. Product property, and these work both ways. They're, so log base B of U times V, we could split this up, or we can combine it as one logarithm. So basically, think of when you multiply two monomials, you add the exponents. And quotient, when you divide two monomials, you subtract the exponents. Now, yeah, it's true, you might have to memorize these, but I threw in a few examples that are purely numeric to show you how this works. So natural log of 6 times 2 times 3. Yeah, I know, basically, here's what happens. What you get out of this is natural log of 6 plus natural log of 2 plus the natural log of 3. 6 times 2 times 3, by the way, you know, that's natural log of 36. If you would actually do natural log of 36, it's 3.58 and change. If you would actually... Oh, I am so... Yeah, no, I was right. It is 36. So... If you broke this up as natural log of 6 plus the natural log of 2 plus the natural log of 3, bingo, you get the same exact thing. Now, that is a good way to help you remember what you need to do here. So, log base 3 of 3xy, oh, let me go back real quick. You know, if I did log of 36, yeah, we do get a different answer of 1.556. But if I did log of 6 plus log of 2 plus log of 3, we get the same thing. Remember, it has to be the same basis. So this would be log base 3 of 3 plus log base 3 of x plus log base 3 of y. And if you remember, and one of the things I love to do with these, log base 3 of 3 is 1. So this is going to be your final answer. 1 plus log base 3 of x plus log base 3 of y. That's how it'll work. For this next one, you have log base 4 of x to the third plus log base 4 of y to the second. And thanks to the power rule, we just bounce the exponents out in front. So we get 3 times log base 4 of x plus 2 times log base 4 of y. So then, you know, now we're dealing with natural logs. We have natural log of x to the 1 half plus natural log of y to the third, and simply moving those exponents out, you have one-half natural log of x plus three times natural log of y. So for the next one, log base four, you have log base four of three plus log base four 
of the square root of x. Well, we're nowhere near done with this. Log base 4 of 3, if you remember, square root of x is x to the 1 half. So you have log base 4 of x to the 1 half. So the final answer will be log base 4 of 3 plus 1 half times log base 4 of x. So now we're going to be dealing with some expressions that require some division here. So, you know, natural log of 3x squared minus natural log of 4y to the eighth. What has to happen, though, is we have to uh, expand upon each of these. So we'll have natural log of 3 plus the natural log of x squared. And then we split this up, natural log of 4 plus natural log of y to the eighth. Now, keep in mind, since those came from the bottom, you know, you could, you have the choice as to when to put this sign here, but this is going to basically have an effect on the final answer. You have natural log of 3 plus 2 natural log of x minus natural log of 4 minus 8 natural log of y. So you had to distribute that, but if you notice, everything that was negative came from the denominator. Everything that was positive came from the numerator. So it wasn't so bad. I like these examples here because, well, they involve some simple numbers. Log base 4 of uh, 4 to the uh, 4 thirds. So for this one, you have, so we're going to see what the calculator does. You know, log base 4 of 4 minus log base 4 of 3. And log base 4 of 4 is 1. So you have 1 minus log base 4 of 3. If we go to the calculator, math, log base 4 of 4 over 3, yeah, you're going to get some decimal. But if you do 1 minus, not 1, but, let's see, that is log base 4 of 3, magically you get the same thing. So I always like to throw in a numeric example because uh, you know, it helps you memorize the rules. So for this, you'd have 1 minus log of 3. And this is base 10 log since there was no log specified. So for this next one, you know, we need to do some more expanding. Log base 6 of 36x to the 5th. So you have log base 6 of 36x to the 5th minus log base 6 of the cube root of y. Now, log base 6 of 36 plus log base 6 of x to the 5th, and then you have minus log base 6, cube root is taking it to the third power, or to the one-third power. Now this, log base 6 of 36 is 2, and then we can move the 5 out, 2 plus 5 times log base 6 of x, minus one-third log base 6 of y. So for this next one, you have log base one half of 25x to the one third minus log base one half of y to the two thirds. Now here's why. x to the m, the nth root of that, that's simply taking x to the m over n. So we would have log base half of 25 plus log base half of x to the one-third minus log base a half 
of y to the two-thirds. Log base a half of 25 plus one-third log base half of x minus two-thirds log base a half of y. So that's how we expand. Now we can condense logs in the same in a similar fashion. So with this, we can condense logs along the same idea. So for this, this would become natural log of 8 over 5. If you wanted to, you could verify this in the calculator. So if you took, you know, natural log of 8 minus natural log of 5, you get that. Now if you took natural log of 8 over 5, what you get is the same thing. So for this, you'd have log base 3 of x times y. Now, we have something in front of the log, so we have to do kind of a reverse power rule. You have natural log of x to the third plus natural log of y to the fifth, which ultimately this becomes natural log of x to the third times y to the fifth. And you'll definitely have these on a test, so be ready. For this next one, you'd have log of x to the tenth plus log of 10 squared. So basically, you have log of 100 x squared. Notice there was no log base, so you can just leave it like that. For this, you'd have log base C of x to the 1 fourth minus log base C of 17 to the third minus log base C of y to the eighth. Now, if you notice, the last two are negative. Now, log base C of, this will be the fourth root of x. Now, if we do a subtraction, but we'll have a parenthesis, log base C of 17 to the third plus log base C of y to the eighth. Here's what happens. You know, you have log base C of x to the, the fourth root of x, 17 to the third times y to the eighth. And the condensation works the same way. Never will I give you ones where, like, one will be positive, then be negative. That's just a little too cruel at this level. You have log base 6 of x minus 3 squared minus log base 6 of x plus 5 to the third. So you get log base 6 x minus 3 quantity squared over x plus 5 to the third. Now for this last one, you have one-third log base 3. So what we can do, you have log base 3 of x minus 7 to the one-third power plus log base 3 of 3x plus 1 to the second power. And I know this last one technically becomes a number, but we're not worried about that. Log base 3 of 81 to the fourth minus log base 3 of y minus 7 to the fifth. Now, we don't have to go as, you know, write it out with as many steps here. But, you know, we're dealing with a log base 3 function. So it'll be the cube root of x minus 7 times 3x plus 1 squared. And then 81 to the fourth times y minus 7 to the fifth. So that's the final answer I would be looking for. These big, big condensing ones are ones that you're definitely going to see on a test. All right, so change of base formula. We really don't use that so much anymore because, for that matter, uh, our logs do 
other bases. But basically, in the good old days before your calculators could do log bases, you would have to take the log base B of U over a common base C. So either way, if I did natural, you know, log base 3 of 50, I could do log of 50 over log of 3. Or for that matter, I could just use a calculator and do, you know, log base 3 of 50. And get 3.56 and change. So for this, you know, I would just do log of 8 over log of 5 log of 12 over log of 3, and then log of 1231 over log of 9. So, that's actually going to be a good lead in here. If I wanted, you know, I could use change of base rule, you know, but we don't actually need to do that anymore. Basically, you know, 2 to the x equals 12. We know x is going to be between 3 and 4. So, this is the equivalent of log base 2 of 12 equaling x. We would originally have to divide log of 12 over log of 2, but if we just do, you know, log base 2 of 12 right here in the calculator, we get 3.5849. But... Let's see, that's 3.5849. But whenever it comes to solving these equations, I'm going to want both forms, both the log and the exact form. I mean, both the decimal approximation and the exact log. So this is going to be a good point to stop us here because, you know, we'll pick this up. In the next video. So I hope you enjoyed this and have a good one. All right everyone welcome back glad to see you here. This is hopefully the third video for exponential and logarithmic. Uh, this is where we're going to get into equations and modeling. So uh, this will start on page 20 in the notes. We'll pick up right where we left off. So what we're going to have to do here is, you know, we, we discussed the change of base formula, but the nice thing is your graphing calculator will have the uh, uh, base, you know, the log base rule. So what happens here is for this one, we are going to get log base 5 of 340 equal to x. So if we go and do that real quick, log base 5 of 340, now that's going to give you the exact answer. If you hit alpha window and choose log base, that's log base 5 of 340, and we get 3.6217. Now, you will have to give me the exact answer. This is the exact answer that I'm looking for, and you will be expected to give me the decimal equivalence. And that is going to be 3.6217. Now for this third one, uh, a lot of people think, oh, that becomes 12 to the x. No, because we have to divide out by 3 here. So we are going to have 4 to the x equal to 200. So x will equal log base 4 of 200. And we want to figure that out, you know, to a decimal, to four decimal places, and x will equal to 3.8219. Now, again, when you do your test on this, you're going to be expected to give me the answer in both forms, in both the logarithmic and the approximate. So if we wanted to graph a function you know, we could use the change of base or the log base. So that's going to take us into exponential and logarithmic equation solving. So we're going to have two forms here. Uh, these will involve exponents with common bases, and then we'll have a batch that don't have common bases. And then we'll have ones with exponents on both sides, and then 
quadratic like ones. So these are some of my favorite ones to solve. Now, what's going to happen here is we've got to get the exponent, you know, get exponents by itself if there's one like this already. So we have a base 2 here. Now, what's going to happen is we know that 64 is going to be 2 to the 6th. You know, that's just something you're going to have to know. So basically, you have 2 to the x minus 5 equal to 2 to the 6. So we've converted that to a very nice common base. And all you have to do here is just set the exponents equal to each other, just like that. You have x minus 5 equal to 6. x will equal 11. So this is where you're really going to have to know your bases here. So for this, we have a base 3, but we've got some work to do. We're going to take away the 5 from both sides first. So what will happen here is we will have 5 times 3 to the 2x minus 7 equal to 1215. And then we're going to divide out by 5, and then we're going to have 3 to the 2x minus 7 equal to 1215 over 5, which is 243. So we have a base 3, and then we have a 243. Uh, spoiler alert, we're only going to be dealing with whole bases here. So if you try powers of 4, you know, 3 to the 4th is 81. 3 to the 5th is 243. So 3 to the 2x minus 7 will equal 3 to the 5th. So... Now that we have the exponents, now that we have a common base, all you have to do is set 2x minus 7 equal to 5. And you get 2x equaling 12, x will equal 6. Now, one thing you can do is you can enter this into your calculator. You know, this is, I'll actually kind of do this. We'll have 5 to the 2, and instead of x, we'll have 6. Oh, wait. Uh, it's actually going to be at 5 times that. 5 times 3 to the 2, but instead of x, we'll have 6. We can put a parenthesis plus 7. In the exponent and then if we hit the arrow key that takes us past that and if we add 5 we get that oh I see what I did it's 2x minus 7 so what I have to do here instead of plus 7 it's minus 7 yeah even the great ones can make mistakes and boom 1220 so nice so, for these two, yeah, now we have exponents on both sides in a lot of these. Now, you know, you have powers, you have a power of 5 here. Obviously, 5 can't get broken down. You know, you have to realize that 125 is 5 to the 3rd. So, we'll have 5 to the 3x plus 1 equaling 5 to the 3rd. We'll replace that 125 with 5 to the 3rd and 2x plus 1. Now, if you remember from your Math 1 days, uh, power rule. So what happens here, you have 5 to the 3x plus 1 equals 5 to the 3 times 2x plus 1, which becomes 5 to the 6x plus 3. So if 5 to the 3x plus 1 equals 5 to the 6x plus 3, we just get the two exponents. 3x plus 1 equal to 6x plus 3, and then we solve that. It's not a 3. So if I want to do that, I'll have negative 2 equal to 3x. x will equal negative 2 thirds. Now, if we wish to check that in the calculator, so here's something really neat that we can do. 
So if x is negative 2 thirds, one thing we can do is I could set up a fraction, you know, negative 2 over 3, and then arrow x. So we have stored that. So if I actually type in 5 to the 3x plus 1, we get 0 0.2. And if we type in 125 to the 2x plus 1, we get the same thing, which is what we were looking for. Pretty neat. So I'm not going to do that for every one of these. So for this next one, uh, you know, 1 16th, what happens here is we can convert these, you know, to powers of 4. I mean, ideally, you could do it to powers of 2. Now, if we leave the left side as a base, you know, as a base of 4, what happens is 1 16th happens to equal 1 over 4 squared, which happens to be 4 to the negative 2. That was one of the rules you were supposed to remember in your preliminary assignments. So what happens now, you have 4 to the 5x minus 1 equaling 4 to the negative 2 to the 3x minus 5. And just like we did in the previous example, thanks to the power rule, we can distribute the exponent. You know, 5x minus 1 will equal 4 to the negative 6x plus 10. So 5x minus 1 will equal negative 6x plus 10. And we get 11x equal to 11. x will equal 1. Perfect. So perfect. Now, for, these, for this next one, we're going to have some powers of 2, it looks like. So for this one, we are going to you know, get everything into powers of 2. So 16 is 2 to the 4th, and 4 is 2 squared, and that, of course, is raised to the 3x minus 7. 32 is 2 to the 5th, and 8 is 2 to the 3rd, and that is x minus 7. Now, we're going to go ahead and take care of the multiplying of exponents right now. So 2 to the 4th times 2 to the, let's see, that would make it 6x minus 14 equals 2 to the 5th times 2 to the 3x minus 21. Now, if you, rem you should remember another rule that you might have, in this case, you have common, you have like bases, and in this case, you add the exponents together. So 2 to the 4 plus 6x minus 14 equals 2 to the 5th times, I mean, not times, but plus 3x minus 21. We simplify both sides. You'll have 2 to the 6x minus 10 equaling 2 to the 3x minus 16. And then that's when you can set the exponents equal, you know, 6x minus 10 equaling 3x minus 16. So if I want to do that, I would have 3x equaling negative 6, x will equal negative 2. Now, the other thing is there is no need to check exponential equations because domain is always going to be all reals. Now, if it were a logarithmic equation, that's different, but we're not going to get into that yet. Now, for this next one, we've got to get everything by itself here. So we're going to add the 28 first. So we'll have negative 4 times 27 to the 2x minus 1 equal to negative 1,000 plus 28, which is negative 972. Then we'll divide out by the negative 4, because again, you should have exponents by itself. So then you have 27 to the 2x minus 1 equaling 
243. So we know we're dealing with powers of 3 here. So 27 is 3 to the third, and that's 2x minus 1 equaling 243. That is 3 to the fifth. So we'll have 3 to the 6x minus 3 equals 3 to the fifth. So 6x minus 3 is going to equal 5. 6x will equal 8. X will equal 8 sixths or 4 thirds. So, yeah, and you will be expected to have the answers in simplest fraction. You know, no decimals for these. All right, we're just going to keep on moving with these. Uh, we've got powers of 5. So 5 is just, you know, 5 to the first. That helps us in this problem, 5 to the first times 5 to the second, but we have 8x minus 5. 125 is 5 to the third, and that 5 to the x plus 3. So we have 5 to the first times 5 to the 16x minus 10, equaling 5 to the third plus x plus 3, 3 plus x plus 3, so we have 5 to the 16x minus 9 equaling 5 to the x plus 6. So 16x minus 9 equals x plus 6. 15x equals 15. x is going to be 1. All that convoluted stuff comes out to a nice simple answer. And that's how these are going to result. So, now for this one, the, this one's kind of a nifty challenge. First, we're going to take away the 29 from both sides. So we have negative 6 to the 3x minus 2 equaling negative 187 minus 29, which is negative 216. Now, you know, you're thinking, oh, that's got a negative base. No, don't consider that. If we divide or even multiply by negative 1, we now have 6 to the 3x minus 2 equaling positive 216. And, six to the, and 216 is 6 to the third. I'm never going to give you one that has like a rational root like, like 8 to the 3 fourths or something like that. That's just uh, a little too much. So we have 6 to the 3x minus 2 equals 6 to the third. 3x minus 2 equals 3. 3x equals 5. x will equal 5 thirds. And there's your answer. So that's how we solve exponential equations with a like base. You know, with a common base now. And you'll be told... Don't use logarithms for these because we don't need logarithms. And you'll be told specifically, don't use logarithms. Now, what if we have to use a logarithm? What if we don't have a common base? You know, 4 to the x equals 21. That, unfortunately, is going to require the use of logarithms. Now, for a thing like this, all we have to do is convert this to a logarithmic function log base 4 of 21 equals x and there's your final answer now of course i'm going to want the decimal equivalents so x will be 2.1962 now for all of these yeah you can you could actually take a log of both sides i mean you can do this two different ways I'm going to show you how this first one would be done another way. So I'm just going to kind of leave, you know, put this off to the side a little. And we do have a second way. You can decide, I'm not going to do them both ways each time. But since it's a base 4, we have log base 4 of 4 to the x equals... Yeah, you know, we have a 21 here. We have to take log base 4 of that side. 
So what happens here, thanks to the power rule, this x would get moved out front. x times log base 4 of 4 equals log base 4 of 21. Now log base 4 of 4 is just 1. So you get x equal to log base 4 of 21. So it'll be that simple. Of course, I like the first way, the first method of solving these. Now for this, we can convert this to a logarithm, to the logarithmic form, log base 6 of 692 equals 3x plus 1. Oh, not plus 1, minus 1. So, here's what we'll do. Well, we got to solve this for x, so we're going to add 1 to both sides. And what happens here, you get log base 6 of 692 plus 1 equal to 3x. Now, you won't need to do anything with that here. You know, log base 6 of 692 is going to be a numeric value, and this 1 is another numeric value. So, basically to solve this for x, we can divide both sides by 3. So, x will equal log base 6 of 692 plus 1 over 3. There's no need to simplify that anymore. Now, what you can do, if we want to round that to four decimal places, uh, we can use the calculator. Well, first, we actually need to do the fraction. So, yeah, log base. So this is log base 6 of 692. Then, you know, the plus 1 that comes after that over 3. And it'll get me 1.5499. Now, here's a nifty thing. Let's say I want to store that to x. Now, what happens is if I do 6 to the, let's see, that would be 3x minus 1. Here's the neat thing. You get 692. So that's kind of a cool way to check your work. So I kind of like that a lot. So, yeah, the x value for this, the approximation, and again, you get 1.5499. Now, if you actually tried to use a computer algebra system, it would give you a totally different answer, you know, but I'm going to expect you to show me some work here. So for these next two, we've got to get exponents by itself, so we're going to subtract 2 from both sides, and then we have 3 to the x minus 7 equaling 87. Well, at that point, we can go ahead and convert that to a log. So this is log base 3 of 87 equaling x minus 7. And then all we got to do is add that 7 to both sides. So x will equal log base 3 of 87 plus 7. Notice that I put the 87 in a parenthesis. I'm going to expect to see that when you do your test for this. So log base 3 of 87 plus 7, we get 11.065. So for this one, we have a multiplier. No worries. We have 2. We divide it by 2, and we have 1 third to the 3x minus 7 equaling 41 at which time we can convert that to a log. So we have log of base one-third of 41, notice I put that one-third in a parenthesis, equaling 3x minus 7. I'm going to put this 41 in a parenthesis just to you know, make it a little more streamlined. So we have to add that 7 to both sides. So we have log base one-third of 41, plus 7 equaling 3x. So we've got to divide by 3. So this is what it will equal, and to find the decimal equivalence, I'm just going to use my graphing calculator.
and I get 1.2066. All right, so we just uh, keep on plugging it away. So we've got, in these cases, we've just got to get the exponent by itself. So we have to subtract the 7 from both sides. We now have 3e to the 2x minus 3 equal to 177. We want to divide by 3. So 177 divided by 3 is 59. We have e to the 2x minus 3 equaling 59. Well, in this case, if you remember, this is a base e. So log base e is natural log. Natural log of 59 equals 2x minus 3. So then all you've got to do is get that solved for x. So we add 3 to both sides. So we have natural log of 59 plus 3 equaling 2x and then dividing both sides by 2. Now you could write this as 3 halves but I'm not going to. Natural log of 59 plus 3 dividing that by 2 and if I actually want to figure that out natural log of 59 plus 3 over 2 we get 3.5388 So, we've got another one. We have to take away the 3, and we get 2 times 4 to the x minus 3, equaling 62. We divide out by 2. We have 4 to the x minus 3, equaling 31. So, we now get log base 4 of 31 equal to x minus 3. Oh, that's real simple. And I always like to put this in a parenthesis. So x will equal log base 4 of 31 plus 3. And, yeah, make sure you write that, you know, make sure the argument of the logarithm is inside of a parenthesis. If it's not, I'm going to dock you. And we get 5.4771. All right, we've got a couple more of these to do. So we've got to get the exponent by itself here. Now, one thing we could do, you know, let u equal 2 to the 3x minus 1. So this might make it a little easier for you. So what we would have is 5u plus 14 equal to 94. So we get 5u equal to 80, u equal to 16, but we are not done yet. Why that is, is simply because, so we are not done yet, and the reason is simple. We have not actually solved for x. So you have 2 to the 3x minus 1 equaling u, which is 16. Oh, we don't even need logarithms. But you know what? We're going to do a logarithm anyway. So we're going to convert this. Log base 2 of 16 equals 3x minus 1. So we add the 1. So you have log base 2 of 16 plus 1 and dividing that by 3. Well, guess what? Log base 2 of 16 is 4. 4 plus 1, you have 5 over 3. So this one should have really been in with the previous ones. It's not going to work out this nicely, I can guarantee you that. All right, so for this next one, we'll have negative 94. We'll take away 94 from both sides, and we'll, that'll give us negative 5 times 3 to the x plus 3 equal to negative 306 minus 94, well, negative 306 minus 94 
is negative 400. Now we take we divide out by negative 5 and what we have here is 3 to the x plus 3 equal to 80. Oh, this would be so close, you know, if this if that other side were 81. But let's convert that to log. You have log base 3 of 80 equal to x plus 3. Oh, real simple. All you have to do is now subtract 3. x will equal log base 3 of 80 minus 3. All right, not bad. And log base 3 of 80 minus 3 is 0.9887. That's what we're going to get. All right, we got two more of these. So 10 to the 10 times e to the x plus 4. Okay, what we are going to do is move this 13 over. We're going to add 13 to both sides. And we'll have 10e to the x plus 4 equaling 58. Now, if we divide out by 10, you have e to the x plus 4 equaling 58 over 10. But we have to simplify that to 29 over 5. So e to the x plus 4 equals 29 over 5. Well, guess what? Real simple. We are going to convert this to a log. It's natural log. Natural log of 29 fifths equals x plus 4. All we have to do is subtract the 4. So this will be natural log of 29 fifths minus 4. All right, so for this next one, we're going to take away 44 from both sides. And what we get here, negative 331 minus 44, we get uh, negative 375. You have negative 3 to the x plus 1 equaling negative 375. And if I divide, well, if I divide by negative 1, you know, that will make that, let's see. We'll have 3 to the x plus 1 equaling 375. So all we got to do is convert that. So we have log base 3 of 375 equaling x plus 1. So all we have to do is take away the 1. x will equal log base 3 of 375 minus 1. And which is going to equal 4.3949. So that's how we will do these with, you know, generally for these you'll have just one exponent to deal with. What if we have exponents on both sides? Oh, I love these. Now, here is how I'm going to do this. Uh, what's going to happen is, yeah, when you take your test on this, you could do this one out of three ways. You could take a common log of both sides regardless of the base. Now, the other thing is I'm going to expect an answer in exact form with logarithms as well as a decimal equivalent. So for this one, let's just take, you know, natural log of 3 to the x minus 4. We're taking a natural log of both sides. Natural log of 11 to the 2x plus 1. Now, thanks to the wonderful world of power, of, uh, power rule with logs, you have x minus 4 times natural log of 3 equaling... 2x plus 1 times natural log of 11. So what we need to do is distribute. 
you have x times natural log of 3 minus 4 times natural log of 3 equaling 2x times natural log 11 plus 1 times natural log of 11. Now, what's going to happen here is we are going to need to get everything containing x on one side. So, you know, variables on one side, constants on the other. So, in order to do that, I have an x here. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 2x natural log 11 from both sides. Now, the other thing that can be done, we need to move this 4 natural log 3. So we're going to add that to both sides. Don't try to combine. You know, don't try to combine anything until it's all said and done. So you have x natural log of 3. Uh, this all cancels out minus 2x natural log of 11. Now this cancels out here, so we have natural log of 11 plus 4 natural log 3. So what we can do here is factor an x out. Natural log of 3 minus 2 times natural log of 11 equaling natural log of 11 plus 4 natural log of 3. So what we can do is divide both sides by natural log of 3 minus 2 natural log of 11. Natural log of 3 minus 2 times natural log of 11. That'll cancel out. And what we're going to be left with is x equal to natural log of 11 plus 4 natural log of 3 over natural log of 3 minus 2 natural log of 11. So what's going to happen is I want to get a decimal equivalence of this. So using the wonderful graphing calculator, uh, if I set up a fraction, you know, so natural log of 11 plus 4 natural log of 3 closing that parenthesis, of course, and it's going to be divided by natural log of 3 minus 2 times natural log of 11. And we close that up, and we get negative 1.8371. I'm going to store that to x. So, needless to say, x will be negative 1.8371. Now, if I go and do the original equation, you know, 3 to the x minus 4, we're going to get probably a convoluted decimal. And 11 to the 2x plus 1. Look at that. Now we have an equivalence here. So we know we did all right. So, you know, you could have taken a log, you know, a common log, you know, or the base 10 log, you get the same equivalence, but you have to remain consistent. Now, I'm going to show you another way. 3 to the x minus 4 equaling 11 to the 2x plus 1. I'm going to take a base 11 of both sides. So we'll have log base 11 of 3 to the x minus 4 equaling log base 11 to, of 11 to the 2x plus 1. Well, here is why we do that. Now, I could have done log base 3 of both sides. I get, well, if I move these out, I have x minus 4 times log base 11 of 3 equal to 2x plus 1 times log base 11 of 11, which comes out to 1. So what now happens, I distribute here x times log base 11 of 3 minus 4 times log base 11 of 3 equals 2x plus 1. We have, some, we have fewer logarithms that we have to deal with here. 
And just like before, we are going to have to move everything over to one side in order to make this work. And I'm sorry this is so crammed, but so what will happen here is you know, you have x times log base 11 of 3 minus 2x equaling 1 plus 4 times log base 11 of 3. x times log base 11 of 3 minus 2 equals 1 plus 4 times log base 11 of 3. And if I divide out here log base 11 of 3 minus 2, and I want to do this, and I can verify this using my log base. You know, I'll have to put a 4 in front of this. Well, actually, a 1 plus 4 times log base 11 of 3 over top of log base 11 of 3. minus 2. And what's going to happen here is we get the same thing as before. So this one can be done in a multitude of ways. We could actually take a log base 3 of both sides if we had wanted to. But we're just going to do, you know, we're just going to keep this simple here. I'm only going to do it one way, but, you know, I'm going to do it different ways, you know, each time. Well, I'm going to do one problem at a time here. So let's go to let's go to five to the three x minus one equaling eight to the x plus one. So I think I'm going to take a log base five of both sides. So log base five of five to the three x minus one equal will equal log base 5 of 8 to the x plus 1. And just like before, we can move those exponents out in front. So we'll have 3x minus 1 times log base 5 of 5 equaling x plus 1 times log base 5 of 8. Now, here's the nice thing. Log base 5 of 5 is just 1. So on this side, you have 3x minus 1 equaling uh, x times log base 5 of 8 plus log base 5 of 8. So we can just add and subtract some things. So we'll take away, you know, minus x log base 5 of 8 minus x times log base 5 of 8. What happens here is that all cancels and we'll add 1 to both sides. So this and this will offset. And what that gives us is 3x minus x times log base 5 of 8 equaling log base 5 of 8 plus 1. Now, yeah, this leaves us with fewer logarithms. If I take the x out, you know, that's 3 minus log base 5 of 8 equal to log base 5 of 8 plus 1. And then we're going to divide out both sides by 3 minus log base 5 of 8. So what happens is we have x equal to log base 5 of 8 plus 1 over 3 minus log base 5 of 8. And yeah, 3 minus log base 5 of 8. And if I want to figure out the decimal equivalence to that, yeah, I'm just going to use my calculator here. Log base 5 of 8 plus 1. 3 minus log base 5 of 8, and I get 1.342.
All right, we've got two more of these to do. So for this next one, you have 7 to the x minus 2 equaling 12 to the x plus 8. I am going to go ahead and take log base 12 of both sides. So you have... All right, so for this... Uh, yeah, we're going to take log base 12 of both sides. So what happens here, we'll have log base 12 of 7 to the x minus 2 equaling log base 12 of 12 to the x plus 8. And, of course, you could have taken a common log, you know, either natural log or base 10 log, and you get the same answer. I mean, you'll get the same final answer. And I actually worked these out on a test three different ways myself. So we have x minus 2 times log base 12 of 7 equaling x plus 8 times log base 12 of 12, which comes out to 1. So you have x times log base 12 of 7 minus 2 times log base 12 of 7 equaling x plus 8. So we're going to subtract x from both sides, and that will get rid of that. And we're going to add 2 times log base 12 of 7 to both sides. So what happens then, uh, this offsets as well, you have x times log base 12 of 7 minus x equaling 8 plus 2 log base 12 of 7. And all we have to do here is factor the x out. So you have x times log base 12 of 7 minus 1 equaling 8 plus 2 log base 12 of 7. And then we'll divide out by log base 12 of 7 minus 1. And what's going to happen here is obviously this will offset each other and you will have x equaling 8 plus 2 times log base 12 of 7 over log base 12 of 7 minus 1. Now, yeah, when you take your test, I actually have my answers in multiple forms. So I'm going to be able to recognize it whether you took a common log, a base 12 log, or a base 7 log. I mean, you could take a base 6 log. It really makes no difference. And we get negative 44.1025. All right, so for this last one, I'm going to try, I'm actually going to do this last one. So for this last one here, I'm actually going to do a common log. I'm going to do just a base 10 log. So what will happen is we'll have log base 10, or just log, of 12 to the 3x minus 1 equaling log of 17 to the x plus 4. So what we'll do with that is move the exponents out in front. So you have 3x minus 1 times log of 12 equaling x plus 4 times log of 17. Now, here's something that might make your life a little easier. We could let a equal log of 12 and b equal log of 17. So what that does here is 3x minus 1 times a equaling x plus 4 times b. We still have to distribute. So we have 3ax or 3xa minus a equaling bx plus 4b. Now, we've got to get, so this actually, I like doing this, and here's why. 
there are, there's less to write. So we're going to add A to both sides. And we're going to, so what happens here, that and that cancel. Then we're going to subtract BX from both sides. You know, that'll offset. So what'll happen is we'll have 3AX minus BX equaling 4B plus A. We can take an X out of these two. You know, that gives us 3A minus B equal to 4B plus A or A plus 4B. We have to divide by 3A minus B. So what happens is we have x equal to 4. Now b, you have 4 log 17 plus a, which is log of 12. And that will be divided by 3a, that is 3 log of 12 minus b, which is log of 17. So that's not bad. So another one of my favorite equation types, quadratic-like exponential equations. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to have to do a u substitution. So u should always equal whatever the middle term is. I mean, you can use whatever letter you want. So in this case, u would equal 2 to the x. Now, how would we figure u squared? Well, u squared, actually, yeah, u squared will equal 2 to the x squared, which you multiply the exponents, that's 2 to the 2x. So we have a couple of replacements. You know, we have u squared minus 4u minus 32 equaling 0. And that's how... Most of the, that's how these will all work. You know, whether it's a base two or, you know, whatever that is. So we can solve this by factoring or what have you. We have to solve for u. And what we have to do, I'm going to complete the square. u squared minus 4u will equal positive 32. Half of negative 4 is 2. That squared is 4. And the other nice thing is these equations, for the most part, will come will be fairly calm. You have u minus 2 quantity squared equal to 36. So we can take both sides of this, square root of both sides, and what that gives us is u minus 2 equaling plus or minus 6. So if u minus 2 equals 6, u minus 2 equals negative 6, u is going to equal 8, u is going to equal negative 4. Now, remember u was 2 to the x, so 2 to the x equaling 8. That means x will equal 3. Of course, you could do a logarithm and get it that way. Now for this, 2 to the x equals negative 4. If you convert this, log base 2 of negative 4 equals x. That is no solution. That basically gives us no solution. So effectively, this is our only solution. All right, so for this next one, you have 3e to the 2x. So if u equals e to the x, so yeah, u equals e to the x, and if I square this, you know, square both sides, what happens is u squared equals e to the 2x. You don't have to necessarily show this, but the reason I'm doing this is to show you where it comes from. So you have 3u squared minus 31u plus 56 equals 0. Oh, we've got another quadratic factoring problem. Oh, I love these. 
So I need two numbers that have a sum of negative 31 and a product of whatever 56 and 3 is, 168. And the two numbers that will make that work, you know, yet you might have to play around with this. No. Let's see. Eight and seven. Oh. Thirty-seven and six. No. Thirty-six and five. So we have to figure that out. Give you a minute to do that. All right, so we found the two numbers that make this work, negative 24 and negative 7. So uh, factor by grouping, of course, you could have completed the square. So you have u minus 8 and then minus 7 times u minus 8 will equal 0. In this case, you, know, you have 3u minus 7 and u minus 8 equaling 0. So you have 3u minus 7 equals 0, and u minus 8 equals 0. So solving each of those for u, you have 3u equaling 7, u equals 7 thirds. And in this one, u is going to equal 8. But if you remember, u was e to the x. So you have e to the x equals 7 thirds. x will just be natural log of 7 thirds. And in this case, you have e to the x equals 8. x is just going to be natural log of 8. Now, one thing you can do is we could actually plug those in one at a time. So if I do natural log of 7 thirds, and I can actually zap that to x real quick. You know, you have to check these one by one. So... 3 times e to the 2x, and getting out of that exponent, minus 31 times e to the x, and then plus 56. So you have to get past that exponent, plus 56, and that does equal 0. And if we actually do this, natural log of 8, store that into x, and here's the other nice thing. I can actually go back up here, plug that in, and I still get the same thing. All right, so there will be a fourth video for this. Uh, reason is I've actually just run short on time, and the fourth video will be material for the rest of this particular unit. So hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Goodbye and good luck. Welcome back everybody to what I believe will be the last video in our exponential and logarithmic function series. So this here is part four. So we're going to pick up right where we left off. So that is also on page 25. So what happened here, there was a typo, uh, 3 times 3 to the 2x minus 13 times 3 to the x, that should be 3. If the exponential bases are different, there is no way in, in heck you could solve this. So what we'll do is just let u equal 3 to the x, henceforth u squared equals 3 to the 2x. So what we get out of this is 3u squared minus 13u plus 4 equal to 0. So what we need here are two numbers that have a, that have a sum of negative 13 and a product of positive 12. Where did the 12 come from? That's 3 and 4. So the two numbers actually very easy, negative 12 and negative 1. So we have 3u squared minus 12u minus u plus 4 equal to 0. Factor by grouping. Of course, you could have solved using any method such as the quadratic formula or whatnot. We have 3u, which gives us u minus 4. Since this is a negative, I can take a negative 1 out and I get u minus 4. And this whole thing equals 0. So u minus 4 
times 3u minus 1 is going to equal 0. I, keep say, I kept saying quadratic equations will never go away. So if u minus 4 equals 0, that means u is going to equal 4. And if 3u minus 1 equals 0, u is going to equal 1 third. But if you remember, now we have to re-back substitute. 3 to the x will equal 4. So what has to happen here is we convert this to a logarithmic model. So x will equal log base 4 of 3. Oh, I'm sorry. I stand corrected. That would be log base 3 of 4. Now for this one, you have 3 to the x equals 1 third, which happens to be 3 to the negative 1. You don't even need logarithms for this. x is just going to be negative 1, and you're done. So for this last one, we have base e's here. So if we let u equal e to the x, and then u squared equals e to the 2x, what happens is we get 6u squared minus 29u plus 35 equals 0. And these would always be factorable, but I am going to have some fun with this one in the sense that I feel like using completing the square. So we have to divide everything out by 6, so we'll have u squared minus 29 6u, and that will equal negative 35 6. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we have to add to both sides of this equation? Well, half of 29 6 is 29 twelfths, and that squared is 841 over 144. And so that's what we're going to be adding to both sides. So what we get out of this is u minus, why is it minus? Well, because this sign being a minus. u minus 29 twelfths quantity squared equal to whatever negative 35 6 plus 841 40 fourths is And let's see what we get here. And that will be 1 out of 144. Hmm. Very nice. Because what happens now is when we take the square root of both sides, we'll have u minus 29 twelfths equal to plus or minus 1 twelfth. So u will equal uh, 29 twelfths plus or minus 1 twelfth. So we get 30 twelfths, which is equivalent to, let's see, if I were to divide by 3, that would be 10 fourths. Dividing by 6, that would be 5 halves. And for this one, we would get 28 twelfths. Well, if I divide by 4, we get 7 thirds. So what happens, though, is we have to back substitute e to the x equals 5 halves, e to the x equals 7 thirds. So basically, x will equal the natural log of 5 halves, or x will equal the natural log of 7 thirds. So those are going to be your solutions for this particular one. Not bad. So we're going to move on to logarithmic equations. So very similar to, you know, we have to get the logarithm part by itself first, which that's already done in the cases of these two problems, first two. Since this is a base 3 log, what we have to do is we're going to have a base 3 here on both sides. So x will be 3 to the 5th, or that will become 243. And we should check those. So if we want to check, does log base 3 of 243 
is that equal to 5? Well, guess what? We're going to look. Log base 3 of 243, indeed it does equal 5. So it's good. That's going to come into play when we have what we call extraneous solutions. Now for this one, you know, we'll have a base 5. So then you'll have 3x minus 4 equaling uh, 125. 3x will now equal 129. x will have to be equal to, I believe that would be 43. So if I go in and uh, do this in the calculator, you know, log base and what was this base? This was a base 5. So log base 5 of 3 times 43 and what came after that minus 4, we should get 3. Real simple. So for these next two, we've got to get the logarithm all by itself. So, you know, you could actually do like a u substitution, you know, call this u equal to log base 4 of 3x minus 5. So what you then get is 2u plus 8 equal to 12. So that means 2u equals 4, u is going to equal 2. But we're not done yet because we have to reback sub and get log base 4 of 3x minus 5 equal to 2. So we have a base 4 here. So Basically, the 4 and the log base 4 offset one another. You have 3x minus 5 equal to 16. x is going to equal 7. Now, what we can do is, uh, just like I showed you in class, we can store 7 to x. And so if I type in 2 times, you know, that's log base 4, of 3x minus 5 plus 8, it equals 12. All right, so we'll do this last one here. Now, you don't have to do a u substitution or anything if you don't want to, but I kind of like to. It's fun. u will equal the natural log of x minus 4. So what you have here is 5u minus 3 equal to 22. 5u equal to 25, and then u is going to equal 5. But we're not done yet because natural log of x minus 4 will equal 5. Now, what is the base for natural log? It is base e. So, by doing that, we have x minus 4 equals e to the fifth. We'll add 4 to both sides. So x will simply equal to e to the fifth plus 4. And if we want to verify that, we can do that as well. So if I were to actually do this in my calculator, e to the fifth plus 4, storing that in for x, what will happen now is I can type in 5 times natural log x minus 4 and then minus 3 after that and we should get 22. All right, not bad, not bad at all. So for this next set of logarithmic equations, this is where it can get a little more fun because we're going to have to either expand or condense. So what I mean by that is we'll now have log base 3 of x plus 6 times x plus 4 equal to 1. So now that we have a single log, this was a base 3 log, so we can put a base 3 here on both sides. That'll cancel that out, or yeah, that'll they'll offset each other. x plus 6 times x plus 4 equals 3 to the 1, or 3.
And as you probably should have remembered from the first unit, you cannot just set each of those equal to three. We actually have to FOIL, that would give us x squared plus 10x plus 24 equal to three. And subtracting three from both sides, what happens is we get x squared plus 10x plus 21 equal to zero. So then what happens is we can factor this. This will be x plus 7 and then x plus 3 equal to 0. So we'll get x plus 7 equal to 0, x plus 3 equal to 0. So if x plus 7 is 0, x is going to be negative 7. And in this case, x is going to be equal to negative 3. Now, you would have to check each of these. The x equal to negative 7 will not work, and here's why. If you put negative 7 in for x, you get a negative. It doesn't matter if only one of them is negative. If you have a log of anything negative, that's going to cause a, that's going to cause a problem here. So, so what will happen is if we stored x equal to negative 7 into the calculator, we get a non-real answer out of that. But if I were to actually plug negative 3 in for x and do this, you know, retype, instead of having to retype it, I can just go up here, highlight it, and we get 1. So x equals negative 7 does us no good. This is the only valid solution, and you can definitely expect there to be a problem like that on your test. So for the next one, we have the we have a subtraction here. So basically what happens here, we have log base 2, x plus 2 over x minus 5 equal to 3. So then what has to happen is we have to bring down a base 2. So we have x plus 2 over x minus 5, and that will equal 8. But let's make that 8 over 1. And here's why. We could easily cross multiply. You know, you have 1 times x plus 2 equal to 8 times x minus 5 x plus 2 equaling 8x minus 40. And so what will happen here, 42 equals 7x, x will equal 6. So if we were to actually do, you know, log base 2 of 8 plus, or no, I stand corrected. Well, it actually wouldn't matter. Is, you know, log base 2 of 1 will equal 3, and so it'll work. So actually, if it's a difference, it's actually a good thing because this will result in a nice, simple, simpler linear equation. So moving right along, so believe it or not, this is a little bit simpler here. You know, it's basically the same idea. You know, these are base 10 logs. You know, you have log of x plus 3 times x minus 2 equal to log of 14. And so what happens here is, you know, we would effectively bring down a base 10. So what happens is you have x plus 3 times x minus 2 equal to 14. So that's x squared plus x minus 6 equal to 14 subtracting 14 on both sides. And what happens is you have x squared plus x minus 20 equal to 0. So you have x plus 5 times x minus 4 equal to 0. If x plus 5 equals 0, x is going to be negative 5. If x minus 4 is 0, x is going to equal to positive 4. So what ends up happening here, negative 5 is going to fail because that makes a log negative, but the floor will be good. Ooh, for this one, this is where, this next one is going to be a goodie. 
we can take the ratio here, natural log of 3x minus 4 over x plus 2 equal to the natural log of x minus 2. Effectively, we bring down a base e, but what happens here, we have 3x minus 4 over x plus 2 equal to x minus 2 over 1. And we can cross multiply. We're going to have a quadratic out of this deal. So you have 1 times 3x minus 4 equal to x squared minus 4. So 3x minus 4 equal to x squared minus 4. So we can just uh, cancel those out. x squared equals 3x. What we can do is you know, subtract that 3x from both sides, and then we can factor x times x minus 3 is going to equal 0. So x will equal 0, x will equal 3. Now, the 0 is going to fail, but the 3 will not because, you know, that's natural log of 5 minus natural log of 5 equal to natural log of 1. So it all works out. So we've got two more of these to do uh, where we have to combine and bring down what appears in this case to be a base 2. So we'll have log base 2 of x plus 3 times x minus 1 equal to 5. So we'll bring down a base 2. So we'll have x plus 3 times x minus 1 equal to 2 to the 5th, which is 32 x squared plus 2x minus 3 is going to equal 32. If I take away the 32 from both sides, what ends up happening is I get x squared plus 2x minus 35 equal to 0. You know, this factors into x plus 7 times x minus 5 equal to 0. So what happens is we get x equal to negative 7 x will equal positive 5. The negative 7 is not going to work. So that's how it's going to be. All right, so for this next one, we have base 3 log. So, you know, log base 3 of x minus 1 times x plus 5 will equal 3. So we'll bring down base 3s on both sides. So what we end up with is x minus 1 times x plus 5 equal to 27. x squared plus 4x minus 5 equal to 27. If we take away 27 from both sides, what ends up happening is we get x squared plus 4x minus 32 equal to 0, which in turn this will factor into x plus 8 and then x minus 4 equal to 0, x will equal negative 8, which is no good, x will equal 4, which will be good because, you know, log base 3 of 3 plus log base 3 of 9, 1 plus 2 equals 3. So, pretty neat how all that works. So you'll definitely encounter one or two, you know, you'll definitely encounter two logarithmic equations on your test. Well, I don't know. Depend. We'll see. All right. So suppose a population of a large country is given by 25, P of T equals 25 times 1.051 to the T, where P of T is the population in millions so, you know, if you recall, the base equals 1 plus r. So, 1.051 equals 1 plus r. r is 0.051, or simply 5.1%. So, what we can do with this, now keep in mind, this is the population in millions. So, T is the number of years, 
since 2000. So 2025, that means we're going to let t equal to 25. So what happens here is, you know, p of 25 is going to be 25. I guess that's the initial population value times 1.051 to the 25th power. And if when we figure that out, it is going to be 86.7 million people. So, now, we are going to now break into finding when is the population going to be 50 million, 100 million, or 1 billion people. So, here's the thing, 50 million. One of the things worth noting is 50 million is fewer than 86.7 million. So we know this is actually going to occur before 2025. And 100 million, since 86.7 is less than that, we know that this is going to occur after 2025. Now, would I make you write that out? No. This kind of gives you a heads up as to where it needs to be. So 50 million, we set 50 equal to 25 times 1.051 to the T. So what we need to do here is divide out by 25 on both sides. And we get 2 equal to 1.051 to the t. Well, guess what? Logarithmic. This is going to be log of base 1.051 of 2 equal to t. Well, guess what? We have the graphing calculator to do that for us. So t, now it's not going to give us the actual year. Instead, it's going to give us a number of years that have passed or lapsed. So, yeah, log base 1.051 of 2, it'll be 13.93 years. Or we can round that, and when you see this on your test or something, I will tell you to round to the nearest year, or 14. But I want to know the actual year, so this is going to be 2014. That's when the population would hit 50 million. I would say round to the nearest year. Now, of course, I might say, you know, months or whatever. Yeah, you know, that's, you know, that depends on what the problem is. Now, let's see when the population is going to hit 100 million. Now, we know that's going to be after 2025. So, fortunately for us, our population is measured in millions. 1.051 to the t. When we divide out by 25 on both sides, we're now going to get 4 equal to 1.051 to the t. So converting that to a log, we get log base 1.051 of 4 equal to t. So t, let's see what that's going to be. Log base 1.051 of 4, and what that will be is 27.9 years, or we can say 28 years. So if we look, you know, in 2025 it was close to 87 million, so it's not going to be too far off when it hits 100 million. So this, by the way, would be the year 2028. Now, we're going to see when this population hits a billion. Now, 1 billion is 1,000 million. So we have 1,000 equal to 25 times 1.051 to the T. So... As you would expect, we're going to divide out by the 25 on both sides, 1,000 over 25. 
we get 40 equal to 1.051 to the t. So then we're going to convert that to a logarithmic log base 1.051 of 40 equals t. And it will be 74.2 years or in the year 2074. Wow. So yeah, we would expect to hit a billion people by that point. And growing at a rate of 5.1%, that's uh, not too absurd. So, uh, our standard model for exponential growth and decay, notice that in this case, you were given the model. We can actually, you know, use a base E or the similar base as before. You know, we're going to see, you know, I'm going to show you how to do that. So believe it or not, if you wanted to convert this to base E, here's the thing. You know, this, oh, why my fingers did that, I don't know. But if I wanted to find the base E model, uh, well, it's going to be 25 times e to something. Basically, I can just take natural log of 1.051, and what I get out of that is 0 0.049742. I know it's a lot of decimal places. 25, it would be 25e to the 0.049. 742t. And so, yeah, and if you did, you know, 2025, you would get all that stuff. Because what happens is when we take that, you know, technically it's a t here. You know, if we took natural law, you know, it's raised to the power of t. So what happens is that's why you put it, you tack on a t at the end. That's if it's a base E. So we can also, so what we're going to do here, this is a standard model with base E. We can do this with either, you know, base E or even a standard base. So what we'll do, suppose that in the year 2000, the population of North Carolina is 8 million people. So in 2010, the population is going to be 9,500,000. You know, we could honestly just do this straight up in terms of, you know, millions instead of having to write it out, write out the whole thing. So, and if you notice, 10 years have lapsed. So, what we're going to do here, f of t, which is the amount of material or the value at a time t, we're going to just do this in millions. 9.5 will equal 8 times e to the k times 10. And what we have to do is simply solve this for k. Now, another thing we could actually do here, you know, 9.5 would equal 8 times b to the t. And that t is actually 10 because uh, 10 years have lapsed. You, you have to have like a baseline and then a... Uh, you, know, you have to have an initial value and then a next value in order for this. So what we would do here is solve this for B. So if I wanted to solve this for K, you know, first I'd have to divide both sides by 8. 9.5 over 8 equals 8E to the 10K over 8. And if I did 9.5 divided by 8, 
I'm going to take it to all of the decimal places. So in this case, we are at 1.1875 equals e to the 10k. So what happens then is I need to take the natural log of both sides. And here's what happens with that. Natural log of 1.1875 equals natural log of e to the 10k. Well, guess what? That 10k moves out in front. So I have natural log of 1.1875 equals 10k times natural log of e. Well, natural log of e is just 1. So I'm going to divide that by 10 now on both sides, and then I'm going to round that to you know, take natural log of 1.1875 and then divide that by 10. You know, so what happens is to six decimal places, I get 0 0.017185 equal to K. Now, if I want to solve this for B, I would divide by 8 on both sides. And so 1.1875 equals B to the 10th. Now, in order to do that, we could just take the 10th root of both sides. So that leaves us with B, but the 10th root of 1.1875 is going to be 1.017334. So these two are not going to be identical in by any means, you know, because it it's either a base E or this. But Here's something interesting. If you actually took, if you actually took e to this, e to the point oh one seven one eight five, you would end up getting that. Yeah, or the opposite if you took the natural log of 1.017334, you would get this. Now, I'm going to tell you specifically which one I want, whether it's a base E or a natural law or a regular base. But either way, so the model, now we could actually do this model two different ways. It would be 8 times e to the 0.07, I mean, no, 0.017185t equals f of t, where t is the number of years since 2000. Because if we let t be zero, you know, that gives us 8 million. So now that we have that down, so what we need to do with this is predict the population of North Carolina in 2020 and in 2050. So in 2020, what's going to happen is that's going to be 20. And in 2050, that means we'll have 50 years gone by. Now, thing is, oh, if I had wanted to, I could have also done, you know, 8 times 1.017334 to the T. We'll see how both of them work the same way. So, with the base E, so that would be 8E to the 0.017185 to the 20th, and if we enter that in the calculator, we would get 
11.28, and I will be very specific, so that would be 11.28 million people in the year 2020. Yeah, North Carolina is growing. Now, if I did the standard model, that would be 8 times 1.017334, to the 20th, which basically means, by the way, we're expect 1.7334% per year. You know, it's a very realistic population growth. And, you know, we get the same thing. So now, 2050... We'll do 8E to the 0 0.017185 and then 50th times 50 in there. And that is going to be 18.89 million people. Where are they all going to go? Oh, maybe they'll go to Duplin County. Now, let's figure out when the population is going to hit 12 million and then 20 million. Well, here's the nice thing. You know, 12 million, uh, we know that that is going to be after 2020. Reason, after, reason it's after 2020 is because in 2020, it's 11.28 million people. So 12 million people by this time so, we'll set 12 equal to 8e to the 0.017185t. We divide out by 8, you know, 12 divided by 8, which is 3 halves, or simply 1.5. 1 1.5 1 .5 equals e to the 0.017185t. So, then we're going to take natural log of each side. So the natural log of 1.5, we move that exponent out in front. Natural log of 1.5 equals 0.017185t times natural log of e, but natural log of e is gone. We divide by 0.017185 on both sides. And let's see what we get. Natural log of 1.5 divided by 0 0.017185. Uh, 23.6 years. So that would be 2023.6 or in the year 2024. Now for 20 million people... Well, let's see. Yeah, 20 million people, that's definitely going to be after 2050. How do I know that? Because in 2050, we haven't even hit 19 million yet. So, 8, oh, I'm sorry, 20 will equal 8e to the 0.017185t. We divide out by 8 on both sides, 20 over 8. And we get 2.5 equals e to the 0.017185t. Taking the natural log of both sides, 0.017185t times natural log of e, which we know is 1, we divide 0 0.017185. And let's see, natural log of 2.5 divided by 0.017185. It'll be 53.3 years. So not too far past 2050. That would be the year 2053.3. All right, not bad at all. So moving right along... We'll do another one of these. The population of the Pittsburgh metropolitan area in 1960 was 1.6 million people. In 2010, it was 1.2 million people. 
So how many years? So basically, we can do this in millions. You know, 1.2 million equals 1.6 times e to the, well, how many years have gone by? Oh, 50 years, 50K. So we divide out by 1.6 on both sides. That's the first thing we've got to do is find the model. 1.2 over 1.6, which nicely is 0.75, equaling e to the 50k. Now the reason that's 50 again is because 50 years have lapsed. So let's take natural log of each side and when we do that, that 50k will just get moved out in front. Natural log of 0.75 equals 50k natural log of e. Well, natural log of e is just 1. So then we divide out by 50 on both sides. So k, rounding that to six decimal places, natural log of 0.75 over 50, we actually get a negative value. Why is k negative? Well, that's because this is a decay model. 0.0057 Five, four. Now, if I actually wanted to find a, you know, find the percentage, I could take e to the negative 0.005754, and in doing that, I get 0.9942, or 0.9943. which means we basically have a, we do have a small percentage decrease every year. So, yes, yeah, so that would be B. So the model would be, if we're doing millions, F of T would be 1.6 E to the negative 0 0.005754 or, or oh, that's 0.5754t or 1.6 times 0.9943 to the t. Either way, we'll get the same thing. I always like to do the E model, well, because it's more fun that way. So Let's see, in 2020, that means T was 60 years. 60 years since then. So, after 60 years, 1.6, and keep in mind, this is in millions. 0 0.005754 times 60. And when I use my calculator... I will be at 1.13 million people, which, you know, in 2010, it was 1.2 million. So 2020, you know, 10 more years go by and we've lost some more people. Let's see what it is in 2050. So that means 90 years have gone by. So 1.6 times e to the negative 0.005754, 90. And we get 0.95, or yeah, 0.953 million, or 953,000. Now, we want to predict when the population is going to be 1 million and then 600,000. All right, so what we want to do now is predict when the population 
would hit one million. So basically one would equal 1.6 E to the negative point oh five seven oh it's double O point oh oh five seven five four T and then six hundred thousand well, 600,000 is 0. 0.6 million. So 0. 0.6 would equal 1.6 e to the negative 0. 0.005754 t. So we've got to get the exponent by itself in both cases. 1 divided by 1. 1.6, uh, we get 0. 0.625. 0. 0.625 equals e to the negative point oh oh five seven five four t we take the natural log of both sides now what happens is if you remember we take the natural log of some or any log between zero and one and what happens is that ends up being negative so then we move that out in front natural log of point six two five equals negative point oh oh five seven five four t times natural log of e well the natural log of e cancels or that just becomes one so we get negative point oh oh five seven five four t and when i do that I get T equal to 82, 81.7 years or 82, and that is since 1960. So if I add 82 to 1960, that would be the year 2042. That was when we expected the population to dwindle to a million. Here's the thing in 2050, it fell to, it was below. A million in 2020 it was above a million so that should give you some perspectives as to what you needed to be now for this one if we divide out by 1.6 0.6 divided by 1.6 we get 0.375 equaling e to the negative 0.005754 t so we take the natural log of both sides. So what happens here, we get 0 .00, negative 0 0.005754. We divide both sides by that. So natural log of 0.375 dividing that by negative 0 0.005754 we get 170 years or 171 and that would be the year 2130 so that's how that's going to work now we can also do applications using half-life now, the purpose of half-life, uh, actually, in the interest of time, I am going to wrap this one up uh, for more application problems. There will be a fifth one, and that will be made uh, probably tonight or tomorrow. So, hope you enjoyed it. All right, welcome back to uh, my series of videos here. So... What, what I want to do here is go over some of these half-life problems here. So, one of the applications of half-life, basically, it is the amount of time it takes for half of a qual uh, quantity of a radioactive substance to disintegrate. So, if it has a half-life of an hour, ha you know, one pound has an element of a half-life of an hour, half pound is disintegrated after an hour. Some uh, nucleides, uh, you know, a little chemistry, some of the shortest half-life, you know, some half-lives are hundreds of millions of years all the way down to polonium-235. 
212 with a half-life of 299 nanoseconds, which is 299 billionths of one second. So in one second, polonium-212 has halved three and a half million times. So osmium-194 has a half-life of six years. So what happens uh, if we use A equals A sub zero, you know, or A of T times E to the KT? So what we can do is basically half, if we let a sub zero, if we let that be one, you know, obviously it, we have half of that left. You know, like for instance, if we started with 500 milligrams of something, after a half-life, we would be down to 250 milligrams after a half-life. So it really makes no difference. We have one E to the 6K. And the reason it's six, you know, that because that's six years. So we need to get this e to the 6k by itself. Uh, spoiler alert, it already is. So we're going to take the natural log of both sides. And what will happen here is, thanks to the fact that this moves out in front, you have natural log of 1 half equals 6k times natural log of E, which just happens to be 1. So K is simply going to be natural log of 1 half over 6. And if you figure that out in the graphing calculator, we get, you know, natural log of 1 half and dividing that by 6, we get K equal, and that's a negative value. And here's why it's negative, because it is a decay. It'll be negative 0.115525. So what happens here is the model simply becomes A of T equals A sub 0 times E to the negative 0.115525. T. You know, basically, you know, that's going to be a model for the decay here. Now, if you were to take e to the negative point one one five five two five, that's going to get us an ex exponential base of point eight nine oh nine. So, that was one way. You know, we could depict the model. Another way could be, you know, A of T, if we use this as base E, A sub zero times 0 0.8909 to the T. So either way, we get that to work. So suppose an accident occurs and has released 500 grams of osmium-194 into the town of Carnegie, Pennsylvania. How long will it take for the material to disintegrate to 100 grams? So we want 100 equal to 500 times E to the negative point 115525T. So we just got to get that E part all by itself. So if we divide out by 500, what happens next is we get 0.2 or 1 fifth equaling E to the negative 0.115525T. So all we have to do is take the natural log of both sides, natural log of 0.2, will equal natural log of e to the negative 0.115525t. And that moves out in front. So you have natural log of 0.2 equaling negative 0.115525t times natural log e, which does naturally simplify to 1. So, if we divide out by negative 0.115525, so what's going to happen here 
you know, if we take natural log of 0.2 divided by negative 0.115525, we get t equal to 13.93 years. So here's the thing. So here's another way to look at this. So 500 grams, you know, after six years, which is a half-life, that's 250 grams. We've disintegrated down to that. After another six years, so that makes it 12 years, we have disintegrated to 125 grams. And then after 18 years, we have disintegrated to 62 and a half grams. Now, we wanted 100, so we know by rule it's going to occur between 12 and 18 years which is 13.93. Kind of a neat little way to figure that out. So let's say a freak accident occurs. This was the you know, Buena Vista, Virginia, a town I lived for six years. Two kilograms of radioactive silver is released into the environment. In order for the town to be safe again, we have to have 40 grams of silver. So given that the half-life is eight days, how long is this going to take? Well, we need to figure out the model. So, you know, one half equals one times e to the 8k, where now we're dealing with eight days here. So if we take the natural log of both sides, and we move that wonderful exponent out in front, natural log of a half, equals 8k and basically you know that just offsets it. so if we divide out by the 8 here what happens is k is going to be natural log of one half and we divide that by 8 it'll be negative 0 0.086643 so the model will be a of t equals a sub zero, you know, the initial amount, times e to the negative 0 0.086643 t. So, based on this, we can figure out how long it takes to do, how long it takes. We start off with two kilograms and see Here's a tricky thing, 40 grams, you know, 2 kilograms, that is 2,000 grams. So now we're going to calculate just how long it's going to take. So 40 will equal 2,000 times e to the, and here's a neat thing, I'm going to let a equal negative 0 0.086643. So we get e to the at, yeah, it says e. But, haha, ha, funny. So, we divide out by 2,000. And when we do 40 over 2,000, we get 0.02. So, 0.02 equals e to the at. I probably should have used a different variable than a because of all this. You know, we could use Q or whatever. But what happens now is we take the natural log of both sides. Natural log of 0.02 equals natural log of E to the AT. So what happens is that AT moves out. Basically, natural log of 0.02 equals A times T. So T will equal natural log of 0.02 over negative 0 0.086643. So, when we figure that out, we get 45.15 days for the half-life. I mean, so here's the thing. So, yeah, 45.15 days so if we start off with 2,000, you know, after one half-life or eight days, we're at 1,000. 16 days, 
we're now at 500, and it keeps on going. We go through multiple half-lives to get to this, but this is what we get. So, Newton's law of cooling could actually be used to determine how long a person has been dead. You know, this is where they get equations for, you know, coroners and such. I'm actually not going to go over this one. I want to hit on logistic modeling. So, next thing we need to look at is logistic growth models. So, what happens here is it's going to be C over 1 plus AE to the negative BT with positive B and C values. Now, you're going to be given this logistic model. So, after T number, so for instance, if we let this function F of T equal 40,000 over 1 plus 21E to the negative 0.25T, that'll model the number of cars traveling on a new road. So, what happens here, after the same day the road is open, now this is T number of months. So, after three months, you know, T will be three. In this case, two years, T is going to be 24. So, what you'd have to do here, you know, 40,000 divided by 1 plus 21e to the negative point 25 times 0. And you plug that into your calculator, and we'll actually do this one here. So, yeah, remember, 40,000 over 1 plus... 21, the E is right here, negative point 25 times 0, we close that up, and we get 18, 1,818 cars. So, what will happen is, you know, we'll figure out how long, you know, after three months, two years, and five years. So watch, because I might have you convert, you know, make sure you know how many months are in a year and so forth. So after three months, we're going to replace this T with a three. And what we're going to get is 3663. So for this, we're going to get 3,663 cars. So after two years, which is 24 months, do this, we are going to get 38,021 cars. Now, at 60 months, we, you know, or five years, we replace this T with a 60 and get basically 40,000. Basically, as T goes all the way to infinity, C, you know, the model, or F of T, rather, F of T is going to approach 40,000. So that's how many, that's the size limit that this particular road can handle. Now, what we can do is we can actually solve the equation, for instance, 20,000, will equal one plot, you know, it'll equal 40,000 over one plus e to the negative point 25t. So what we can actually do here is we can do a cross multiplication. Now, you know, put a one underneath this, you know, when we cross multiply, we get 40,000 equals 20,000 times 1 plus e to the negative point 25t. And conventional wisdom says on the right you would distribute, but we can just divide out by 20,000 on both sides, which will make this 2 equals 1 plus e to the negative point 25t. So what happens then is we subtract the 1, so we'll get 1 equals e to the negative point 25t. 
So what we'll do then is we will want to go ahead and uh, take the natural log of both sides. All right, I did make one slight error. There should have been a 21 in here. So what happens here is we're actually going to have 1, which will equal 21e to the negative 0.25t. So we need to divide out by this 21. So we'll get 1 over 21. We'll leave that as a fraction. 1 21st, 1 over 21, equals e to the negative 0.25t. Now, given our experiences with solving these, uh, you know, obviously this is a base e model. So all you really have to do is theoretically just take the natural log of both sides, natural log of 1 over 21, equals natural log of e to the negative 0.25. 25t. You know, what will happen is we divide out by negative 0.25, yeah, because natural log of e just comes out to 1, so that's, you're going to be left with t there. So natural log of 1 over 21 divided by negative 0.25, we get t equal to 12.17 months. And if we notice, you know, 20,000 was the target. Now, 20,000 happened to occur between three months and two years. So we know, you know, but it did occur before five years. So now we're going to do the 30,000. Now, 30,000 is going to be within the same realm between three and 24. So what we'll do here is... You know, you have 30,000 equal to 40,000 over 1 plus 21e to the negative point 21t. You know, if we divide by 1 on both sides, so 30,000 times 1 plus 21e to the negative point 21t, or 25t rather, will equal 40,000. But we'll divide by 30,000 on both sides. And what we'll be left with, 1 plus 21e to the negative point 25t will equal 4 thirds. So that'll equal 4 thirds. If we take away 1 from both sides, remember 1 is 3 thirds. So 21e to the negative point 25t will equal one third. If we divide out by 21, yeah, one third divided by 21 over one, that's the same as one third times 1 21st, which becomes 1 63rd. So e to the negative point 25t will equal 1 63rd. We'll take the natural log of both sides, 1 63rd, and divide that by negative point 25t, or not negative point 25t, just negative point 25, and let's see what we get. We are going to get you know, t equal to 16.6 months. So it fits our answer. It fits what we were looking for. All right, so for this next logistic one, in a learning theory project, psychologists discover that this model is a model for describing the proportion of correct responses, f of t, after t number of learning trials. So the expected proportion after no trials, that's obviously when t is going to be 0, uh, what we would get is, we'll round that to you know, three decimal places. We get 0 0.307 or 30.7%. So what will happen then, expected proportion after one trial 
So that means t is going to be 1. So we rewrite this, we redraw the function, or we, and instead, we get a 1 for t, we get 0.487, or 48.7%. So what, what's going to happen is, basically, the numerator is your asymptote. So eventually, it's going to be 92%, you know, or the limiting value. So after five trials, then we'll do 10. Let's see what these proportions are after 5 and then after 10. So we hit this. After 5 trials, we are at 0.889 or 88.9%. And then after 10 trials, go ahead and bring this down once more. And then you know, after make that a 10, we are at 0.919 or 91.9%. So it's going to get closer and closer. The limiting value is going to be 0.92 or 92%. You know, for instance, let's say I wanted to, let's say we had, I don't know, 100 trials. If we did that, yeah, eventually, yeah, it is going to hit 0.92. Well, not quite. It'll come very, very close, just like any asymptote would. So, how many trials would be needed to get a proportion of 80%? So, what we would have to do is set 0.80 equal to 0.92 over 1 plus 2e to the negative 0.81t. And, of course, we put uh, a 1 underneath that. Cross-multiplying, we get 0.80 times 1 plus 2e to the negative 0.81t equaling 0.92. But if we divide out by 0.8, what happens here, 1 plus 2e to the negative 0.81t will equal 0 0.92, 0 0.92 over 0 0.8, which is going to be 1.15. So we take away the 1 from both sides. We're now at 2e to the negative 0.81t equal to 0.15. Well, if we divide out by the 2 here, what we get now is e to the negative 0.81t equals 0.075. So, based on our previous, based on all the previous problems, t is going to equal the natural log of 0.075 over negative 0.81. And we get t equal to 3.2 trials. Of course, you know, rounding, you know, obviously this would have to be a whole number. If we look here, we needed 80%. And it's going to occur between 1 and 5. Now, 90% will occur between 5 and 10. It'll probably be closer to 5. So we take that 0 0.9 equal to 0.92 over 1 plus 2e to the negative 0.81t. By cross-multiplying, we get 0.9 times 1 plus 2e to the negative 0.81t equaling 0.92. Then we divide out by 0.9. And what happens here, 0.92 over 0.9, it'll be 1.02. 2 equals 1 plus 2e to the negative 0.81t. If we subtract the 1 from both sides, 
we get 0 0.022 equals 2e to the negative 0.81t. And of course, let's divide out by the 2. We get 0 0.011 equals e to the negative 0.81t. So thanks to our vast number of equations that we solved, you know, t will be the natural log of 0 0.011 divided by negative 0.81. And we get t equal to 5.6 trials, which happens to match with our original work. So not bad. All right, so I like these half-life problems a lot too. So let's say an accident occurs that spreads radioactive 55, iron 55 into the atmosphere. The half-life of iron 55 is 2.737 years. So let's say the concentration at the time of the accident is 782 parts per million. We want it to be 100. Well, first, we've got to figure out the model. So it looks like it's going to take years. So what we'll have here, you know, half of the amount will equal 1 times E to the 2.737K. So... That's how we get that. Basically, we could have done this as, you know, 50 equals 100. Yeah, you know, we start off with 100, we're left with 50. Basically, this is how the half-life equation works. So this is how half-life equation works because, uh, yeah, you're left with one half. So that's how it works. So we take the natural log of both sides. And keep in mind, k is still going to end up being negative. So natural log of 1 half will equal 2.737k. And we divide that by 2.737. So, we are going to get k equal to negative 0.253251. So, the model will be a of t equals the initial amount times e to the negative 0.253251. 251t. Yeah, so this is a pretty good decay model. So now we're going to figure out how long it takes to get to a safe level of 100 parts per million. So, so now we're going to figure out this model. 100 will equal 782e to the negative point 253251t, you know, we could just let q equal negative 0 0.253251. So 100 will equal 782e to the qt. So if we divide by 782, we get e to the qt equaling 100 over 782. Let's take the natural log of both sides. The reason I didn't want to get a decimal with that is simply because this will give us something a little more accurate. So what will happen is you have Q times T equal to the natural log of 100 over 782. And then if we divide out by Q, T will equal the natural log of 100 over 782 dividing that by negative 0.253251. And when we go to figure that out, we get 8.12 years. So here's an interesting thing. So 782 parts per million
if we take the half-life of that, you know, one half-life, a second half-life, a third half-life, it's going to be just before three half-lives. That You know, it'll hit 100 parts per million. So 2.737 times 3, it's going to be, you know, 8.2 years. So that gives us a very nice model. I mean, that gives us a good approximation. Now, uh, so another way that this can be done here, if you were to actually take e to the negative point 253251t, I mean, yeah, e to that with that. Well, here's the thing. So if we actually broke this up, what happens here is negative point two five three two five one. We get point seven seven six three to the t. So that indicates a decay rate of something over twenty two percent per year. Now, so if we were to actually solve the equation using this, you know, one hundred would equal 782 times 0.7763 to the t. Obviously, we can divide out by 782. So 0.7763 to the t will equal 100 over 782. We can convert that to a log equation real easily. We will take log of base 0.7763 of 100 over 782 and when we go to do that you know log of 0.7763 of 100 over 782 what we get here is approximately eight we get the same thing 8.112 years so we can do this, you know, this would be called a base B model. And, you know, the model that we're using is base E, and that is perfectly fine on any test. But I like to show, show how you do this both ways. So, all right, so... Let's say we have an accident involving fermium-257. Fermium is named after Enrico Fermi. Fermi. Half-life of 100.5 days occurs. So let's figure out the model first. So one-half will equal E to the 100.5K. So basically, we get natural log of one-half equaling natural log of e to the 100.5 k you know the reason is is because one half-life has elapsed of 105 days so t will be in days we move this 100 100.5 out in front well basically we have natural log of one half equaling 100.5 k so if we divide out by 100.5 on both sides K is going to equal, obviously, something negative. Natural log of 0.5 over 100.5. It'll equal negative 0 0.006897. So the model would become A of T equals A sub 0 times E to the negative 0.006897. 6897t or you know e to the negative point 006897 we split that up and here's why that gets split up we figure that out real quick e to the negative point 006897 that'll be point 9932 to the T. So we do have two different models to work with. 
that we can that we can work with. Your book would tell you to use the base E model, but I like to do it you know both ways. But we're going to use the base E model. So now we want one percent. So basically, to get one percent of the pre-accident level, we'll have 0.01 equals e to the negative 0.006897t. Now, yeah, one percent of it. For instance, how we got this? Well, let me kind of draw something a bit down here. So let's say we started off with 100 grams of it. And we were left, you know, one percent of one hundred is one. If we divide it out by the one hundred, we end up with this. So we take the natural log of both sides, and we get negative point oh oh six eight nine seven t, and then we divide by negative point oh oh six eight nine seven. And we get t equal to whatever this is, natural log of 0 0.01, divided by negative 0 0.006897. t is going to be 667.7 days. Now, if we divide that by 365, it will be 1.83 years in order to get to the pre-accident level. So that's how this will work. So for this very last model, Wayne County, North Carolina, we're going to use, uh, suppose that in the year 2000, the population of Wayne County was 113,000 citizens. So in 2010, it becomes 122,600 citizens. So, you know, a equals A sub zero times E to the KT. What we'll get here, 122,600 equals 113,000 times E to the 10K. Now, why 10? Because 10 years have lapsed between 2000 and 2010. This was the population in 2010. This was the population in 2000. So we got to get this by itself, so 113,000, we divide out by that, and so one thing we can do here, you know, 1226 over 1130 will equal e to the 10k, and here's why I didn't want to convert this to a decimal, because I want to get something more exact. It doesn't break your neck to do it this way. So if we take the natural log of both sides equals natural log of e to the 10k, while well, that 10k gets moved out in front, effectively we're just going, well, you know what, no, I'm not going to write that out just yet. But what happens here is, yeah, we'll get that. So k will equal the natural log of 1226 over 1130 and dividing that by 10. So k is going to be a positive number this time because we are dealing in fact with a growth model and k is going to be 0 0.008154 So that means the model A of T will equal A sub zero times E to the 0 0.008154 T, or we could convert this to a base B model. Actually, let's not do that just yet. Uh, you know, A of T is, what was the initial population? 113,000. 113,000 times E to the 0 0.008154 T. Now keep in mind, T is the number of years since 2000. 
And you know what? Let's just leave it like this. So here's the nifty thing. So 113,000. So after 10 years times e to the 0 0.008154 times zero, yeah, obviously that's 113, but after 10 years, 122,600. So, well, yeah, that decimal, but see, that's how this is going to work. Now, what we can do is we can do everything with this model. We can actually predict what will happen in the future, you know, 2020 and 2050. So in the year 2020, that means T will be 20. So in order for that to work, all we have to do is just replace this T with a 20. And then we'll replace it with a 50. You know, we'll kind of kill two birds with one stone here. So 133,016. And in 2050, that is where T is going to be 50. That will be 169,879 people. So the last two parts of the question are asking, when is it going to hit 200,000? And then when is it going to hit 1 million? Well, we know that'll definitely be after 2050. So here's the, you know, of course, this is Wayne County. You know, this is actual data here. So 200,000 will equal 113,000 times e to the 0 0.008154 t. So what we can do is divide out by 113,000. And when we do that, you know, 200,000 divided by 113,000, we'll just let that be 200 over 113 equals e to the 0 0.008154 t. So we take the natural log of both sides, natural log of 200 one thirteenths basically equals 0 0.008154t. So if we divide out by that point, oh, not, it's not negative, it is positive, 0 0.008154. So natural log of 200 over 113.008154, it's going to take 70 years or 2070. Now that's assuming that Wayne County is growing at the rate it did from 2000 to 2010. My guess is we'll be at 200,000 citizens long before 2070. Now, let's see how long it takes to hit 1 million equals 113,000 e to the 0.008154t. So if we divide out by 113,000, and what we get here, We'll get 1,000 over 113, your calculator will do that, equaling e to the 0 0.008154t. So if we take natural log of 1,000, 1 thirteenths, that'll equal 0 0.008154t. So when we do that, natural log of 1,000, 1 thirteenths, divided by 0 0.008154, it's going to take, wow, 267 years 
or 2267. Uh, I think it's actually going to be a heck of a lot quicker. You know, Wayne County is growing. So with that in mind, uh, that brings it to the end of this video. And I hope you enjoyed it. So good luck and God bless.